formatted friends. Now I'll try talking. Check, check. Check one, check two. Beastie boys in the house. Any louder yet? Oh, wait, hang on, wrong one. Check one, check two. This is a test. Katie's clicking lots of buttons furiously, so she'll eventually get to the right one. Two chains loud, worst. I can't hear, fine. There's an echo now, better do a backflip. I can't do a backflip. 100 free points would be nice. 500 points. I think you're loud now, right? Okay, am I louder now, everybody? Is it better now or better before? <laughs> Everybody's doing so much crazy crap, you can't tell. I see worse, Asian pride. <laughs> wow, better, better, better. Dude, it's so fast. How do people keep up with this too crap? Loud. Okay, I can bring that the too loud on an issue. Better now. It looks like more people are saying better than worse. I think. But it's going so fast it's hard to tell. Worse, don't hurt me, do a barrel roll, swerve, my ears are be bleeding. <laughs> wow. Just blew my speakers. <laughs> well, if you back up, this is where it's recording right there. Oh, oh so are, are we doing both so mics now? Oh, so this mic's off. So can you still hear me just fine? Where were you? Doing two mics simultaneously, and now and now there probably is more of an echo because if we're going off of this right mic, this is just in the room. Uh, yeah. Is that good? Cool. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this, and uh, I, well, you would think in the world that the video would be the hardest thing to stream, and we have continued to fail and fail and fail every single time with the audio. What's up with that? Okay, we're going to have a lecture now, and uh, let's see, what's my time? It's already five minutes after, four minutes after. So welcome, everyone, to the first official ever World Regions Complete 100% Online Stream Edition. And I can see the chat room, but I'm going to be lecturing, so I don't know that my eyeballs will be able to keep up with the chat room if you ask questions there. You can hit me up on Google Chat, and those questions will pop up on the screen. Legitimate questions only, please, on Google Chat. You can say any damn thing you want to uh, between yourselves. Uh, and people are saying it's pretty bad. I mean, you want to go back to the other mic and talk loud? I don't know what else to do. That's all I got the option to go. Uh, can we do both mics? <laughs> sure. <laughs> what would yeah, I, I can do both. Really? Sound is cracking and there's an echo. All right, we'll try. Echo is that person's computer. That's, that's the echo is your computer is what Katie's saying. You have something else running. We'll try both mics or will that blow the whole thing up? Can it really have two mics feeding in simultaneously? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure it's going to be better or not. I mean, all right. Either they have to turn it up loud or they deal with it. Okay. The one the we'll go forward at this point with the lecture and just adjust. Uh, someone said it will destroy the matrix. That's entirely possible. Uh, but go ahead and adjust your speakers according to whatever sound you're getting right now because this is probably as good as we're going to get. We've got it double mic'd up right now, one through the camera, one through this clip on. We'll see if it works. So, welcome to the full on stream version of our China lecture for world regions. Uh, you can't ask questions through Google Chat when they pop up. They'll be translated to me or Katie will try to point them out. Again, legit questions only uh, that have to do with lecture material. You don't need to say that I need to worship Satan or do a barrel roll or backflip. I'll do all of those things after the lecture. Uh, first off, in the uh, opening moments, as we always do, just to reference a few current events, some crazy stuff going on around planet Earth. I don't know if you've been following it, but you probably should. It looks like Turkey may be getting ready to throw down with Syria at any given moment. This is day six where uh, planes and uh, uh, people have been shooting at each other across the Turkish-Syrian border. 
One of the things I definitely want you to know for the uh, final exam or just for life in general is that NATO has now already made a statement saying, uh, by the way, we're backing up our Turkish boys. Hi, NATO! Article 5, baby! Better watch out, Syria! I've been actually waiting for them to play the Article 5 card all this time uh, because they could have actually, quite frankly, made up some sort of fake attack from the Syrian side onto Turkish soil and used that as a vehicle to start taking out the Syrian Air Force. And that is likely what's going to happen. If Syria and Turkey continue to escalate their shooting at each other, the likely scenario, you heard it here first, bonus points for everybody if I'm exactly right, uh, but if official war is declared, uh, NATO will say, we have to back up our brothers, uh, our brothers in arms in Turkey, and here's how they're gonna do it. Uh, they're not going to send in NATO troops, they're not going to send in humans on the ground, they're not going to invade Syria, but they will say, Here's the deal. Syrian planes have been shooting at Turkish planes. Turkey is a NATO ally and brother. We must defend Turkey's planes. Therefore, i.e., ergo, uh, NATO air power will utterly decimate uh, the entire Syrian air force in 10 minutes or less. That's important because that allows NATO to have an action, help out uh, under the guise of helping out Turkey, and completely change uh, the game on the ground with the Syrian civil war. Because Syrian air power has been the primary m way that the uh, government has been leveling, destroying, and otherwise killing the rebel forces. So in one fell swoop, they can be a game changer by taking out the Syrian air force, and it looks like Turkey may be just the excuse they need to sock it to them, so to speak. Uh, other than that, <coughs> excuse me, I know that cough probably didn't sound very good in the micro microphone. <coughs> One other important note, Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, jawohl, uh, went to Greece and got booed and people were raging at her and all the Greek people, I shouldn't say all the Greek people, a lot of people out protesting because the Greeks, of course, blame Germany, particularly Angela Merkel, for all the austerity measures that are being enacted in their country to get them back on track, to, get, to keep their banking system and their financial system and their whole government held together. The Germans have said, you will do this. You will slash your budget. You will save money. You will not spend on public uh, uh, services, all that stuff. And because, as I suggested to you about a month ago in class, Angela Merkel is such a powerful chancellor, Germany itself is such a powerful state, and Angela Merkel is such a powerful chancellor of Germany, what she says goes. And she is the force behind all the austerity measures in Europe as a whole. So it is being manifest uh, physically, what I was trying to teach you, that the Greeks say, our country sucks, we're broke, and we're getting broker, and the austerity measures are pinching us and cutting us, and we're getting services slashed, and it's all Angela Merkel's fault because she's the one that's making us do it all. That's exactly kind of what I was talking about. And again, there's a little bit of truth to that, uh, but it's not so much that, hey, Angela Merkel's the one that destroyed our country, it's her fault. No, 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 the Greeks destroyed their own country. Angela Merkel is just delivering the bitter medicine they have to take to make it better. Uh, and they're going to uh, focus their rage on her. It's now being speculated that Greece is so bad off and uh, there's so many protests continuing about the austerity measures that indeed it may be a lost cause that Greece even stays in the EU or it, that they would keep the euro. But that's a issue for another time and another place. So those are kind of two kind of pressing in the news stories that I had that I wanted to tr at least relay to you. We got to keep our eye on the Turkish Syrian situation. It has been getting hotter. They again, they've been spatting ever since the whole civil, uh, Syrian civil war started a couple of years ago. But now it's like day six in a row that people are shooting at each other, and it's only going to take one kind of big blow up, one Turkish plane getting shot down or a bomb being dropped on a, uh, a Turkish village that's going to set that thing on fire. And we're going to watch and see what happens because we know all about NATO, and now you know the prediction of what I think is going to happen if that were to happen. Someone said more cowbell, I will do my best. That would be hilarious, by the way. But we should probably get to, oh, I'm sorry, someone's got a question. Uh, uh, Amada says, why didn't that happen, why, did, why that didn't happen long time ago that would have saved many Syrian civilian lives? Uh, because the, uh, uh, the NATO group 
has been hesitant to get involved in this war for fear of escalating it to a broader regional slash global war. Because the last time NATO got involved in a country to help the civilian population uh, from a tyrant was Libya. And when NATO helped out in Libya, this is only about eight months ago, friends, when, when NATO helped out in Libya to protect the people from Muammar Gaddafi, the dictator in charge there, who threatened to kill his, all his own people, uh, the Chinese and the Russians, they didn't vote for it at the UN, but they didn't veto it either. So when NATO went into Libya, I won't say they were, they were supported more by the whole world, but at least they weren't being, uh, uh, there weren't protests about the NATO movement into Libya. This time around is different. Both China and Russia, as you know from our class and current events, have been saying nonstop, we don't think anyone should get involved in Syria. We're going to veto any measure on Syria at the United Nations. We're not going to sanction any peacekeeping force or anything to stop the Syrian civil war. So China and Russia have been very adamant about it, and that's probably one of the reasons why NATO has been treading a very careful line here, saying, hold on, we're not trying to make this whole Syrian mess into a face-off between Russia and NATO or bet between Russia and China and NATO. So that's one of the reasons, and there are probably many more. NATO's strung out, NATO's in Afghanistan, uh, not as many European countries are contributing to NATO. There's a whole variety of reasons why NATO may or may not want to get involved in Syria. Uh, that's just one of them. Politically, it's been a hot potato. So nobody wants the Syrian situation to turn into a, oh look, here comes NATO to save the day uh, while they're pissing off a whole bunch of local Arab folks, killing civilians and all the rest which is the mess they're in in Afghanistan right now. Does that answer your question at least a little bit, Amada? Uh, okay, uh, someone says, uh, Epic Meal says, how will the US ration its troops if war breaks out between Syria and Turkey will most come from Afghanistan? No, uh, as I suggested, and it's a possible exam question, I don't believe there'll be any ground forces involved in any NATO movement uh, into Syria. In fact, as I'm suggesting, I don't think there's going to be any NATO movement into Syria. We, we, this is all speculation at this point. NATO may not do anything. Uh, and Turkey, quite frankly, can take care of itself uh, in this particular case. Turkey could whip Syria's ass, no issues. Not a problem, not even much of a fight to be quite frank. Yes, there'll be some casualties on both sides, but if it was a straight up fight between Turkey and Syria, put your money on Turkey. That's not an issue. So there's not going to be any sort of ground invasion force. It's going to be more an air power assault to take out the, the Syrian air force in its entirety and any kind of tanks or ground defense or missiles, anything that they could blow up with, that doesn't involve humans, that will be the likely scenario that unfolds if it turns into a hot active war between Syria and Turkey. Cool, all right, good. On we go then, let's talk about China. And of course, one of the reasons why I wanted to do the lecture this way is because every time in class that I will say the word China, all you all say, hopefully you all just said rich really loud in your dorm rooms, hope you screamed it really loud and there's people everywhere going, what the hell is everybody yelling rich down the hall for? So the other great reason to do it this way is you can scream uh, rich every time I say China for the next two hours because I'm going to say it like a million times. Uh, it won't be as disruptive to the flow of uh, the lecture. So let's talk about East Asia, our first region actually. We've talked about lots of different things here and there so far this semester and some great current events analysis. But this is our first world region and by your own votes, what's wrong? Am I being too loud? We're so delayed because everybody's saying Oh, right I see, now. I see. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's like a seven second delay of me seeing this comment. So I now I'm seeing 10 million riches scroll up the screen. That's hilarious. Uh, let's see, uh, this is our first world region, as per your votes, you wanted to do uh, uh, East Asia slash China first, uh, and so let's do it. East Asia, the region, the region, uh, but the powerhouse within this region, undoubtedly, no close second, is China. Let me just say this uh, to refresh your memory about what a region is. This uh, area that has some defined borders, they, or they could be fuzzy. Okay, they could be exact, but some borders and some area, and the most particularly important part was that it has some sort of homogeneous trait. So, we're talking about the East Asia region here, and I just did want to point out that 
it's not just China. China's a powerhouse, uh, but when we're looking at the entire region, we're kind of looking at all of China proper, all the way down to Hanan Island down here, uh, and ta including Taiwan, and uh, kind of for the East Asia region, only about half of China, maybe parts of Mongolia, all the way up, but also the Korean Peninsula. So that's the region we call East Asia, and when we start to look at things like uh, history and influence and language and philosophies and government styles, you, you start to look at lots of different things. There's a whole lot of homogeneousness in this area that as we progress north to Russia or as we progress south to Southeast Asia, it is slightly different. So there is a kind of a tight unit here, and it's not even all of China. It's just the eastern half of China that we're going to throw into this East Asia region. But undoubtedly, uh, we're going to throw the Koreas in here and Taiwan. Uh, but undoubtedly, uh, China itself is the real deal, big deal of the region. So I'm going to mostly be talking about China today. I'm going to pull in the Koreas by the end, hopefully, if we have time. Now, I'm going to try to keep this as simple and straightforward as possible. So there's about five or six or seven things I think you need to know about China things you need to understand about China. And I'll go into more detail on some, less detail on others. First thing you need to know, thing one that you need to know about China is there are ginormous, gigantic, huge, big differences between East and West China. Again, just put the Koreas and Taiwan off on the back burner for a second. There's big differences between Eastern and Western China. So let's look at China physically first. When we're thinking about China physically, the first thing I want you to understand and know for the final exam uh, and for life is that it's almost exactly the same size as the United States of America. And actually, it's about the same latitude as well. This is a map that's superimposing China onto the United States that's keeping size and latitude the same. That is, in, in proper perspective to each other where they are on planet Earth. And you can see, by just looking at the graphic, that China and the United States are about the exact same size. In fact, half the world atlases you ever look at will say that the U.S. is the third biggest country in the world and China's the fourth, and the other half will say China's the third biggest country and the U.S. is the fourth. It's truly that close. Our countries are almost identical in square miles, or square kilometers for you Europeans. Uh, and the other thing to consider is latitude-wise, we're about the same latitude. We're about at the same part of the planet uh, both countries are, except that China is slightly bigger kind of north to south, excluding Alaska uh, for the United States. You see that Hanan Island in southern China uh, actually flows a little further south uh, than uh, uh, the tip of Florida and Texas, and it actually goes considerably further north than, say, um, even Maine or Washington. So s more latitude range in China. But east to west coast of the United States and the eastern to western side of China, about the same, about the same size. A road trip across America would be about a road trip across China. Oh, oh, oh except that China way different physically than the United States is. Uh, the eastern sides are kind of similar. What I mean by that in this uh, map you're now seeing is uh, uh, shaded relief. The green areas, uh, by the way, people see these maps and they think they're vegetation maps. They're like, oh, green means grass and brown means dirt. No, 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 no. This is a re elevation uh, map that's shaded. So the greens are the low coastal flat plains. Uh, and then as you get up into the yellows and the darker browns, it's uh, higher and higher mountains, higher and higher elevation. So you can see by looking at China that there are big swaths of the whole eastern seaboard that are kind of low coastal plains, and especially around this big river system. Flat, flowing, low coastal plains, much like, say, uh, eastern Virginia, or most of the eastern seaboard of the United States, east of the Mississippi. It's about like that in these green areas. But you see in the north, especially up here, but even spotting down in the south in the uh, southeastern quadrant, there are some hills about the size of, say, the Appalachians are a little higher, more kind of up, a little higher hills, but not gigantic mountains. But as you progress westward in China, you get into some higher and higher and way higher ginormous mountains on the Tibetan Plateau. This whole big brown football shape is the Tibetan Plateau. The average altitude or uh, height of the Tibetan Plateau, just the average, just the average of the Tibetan Plateau is like 12,000 feet above sea level. 
We're here in Blacksburg, we're at 2,000 feet above sea level. The Appalachian Mountains are roughly three to 4,000 feet above sea level. The base of the whole Tibetan Plateau, this big football egg here, is 12,000 feet. And then you start putting some gigantic ass mountains on top of that. And this is where you have the Himalayan range on this fringe between China and India, where you have some of the highest mountains in the world uh, in 20,000, 22,000, 25,000 feet above sea level. The highest range on planet Earth. So here's the trend, looking at it, the color code. The trend I want you to understand from east to west in China is, as you're on the coastline of China, and you are, say, splashing around in the Pacific, and you get up on a beach uh, outside of Beijing, and if you start walking due west, here's what happens. Uh, it gets higher. On average, you're going to go through the coastal plains and you get to some higher mountains and you're going to get some rocky mountains, mountains types of mountains, and then you're going to get the Tibetan Plateau, gigantic mountains on planet Earth. As you progress west, it gets higher. But something else happens too. Oh, by the way, here's an awesome uh, side shot, profile shot. If you were to just to cut Asia in half, and you can see the Korean Peninsula over here on one side, you see the low coastal plains I'm talking about and some bumpy mountains, especially down the southeast. And then they start to rise, and this is about as high as the Rocky Mountains right here. And then you get up to the Tibetan Plateau where you're getting into Ginormo Mountains. So that, that really kind of sums it up. As you go westward, you're climbing in elevation pretty much the whole way. But something else happens, and that was what I was getting ready to say. Something else happens uh, as you progress. Latitude is similar to the United States, as is the vegetation, but only on the eastern side. Okay, so as I suggested, southern parts of China, the climate over here is kind of like Florida, or even the climate of China right here is probably like the climate of, of Virginia, and the climate here in Manchuria, that's this big northwestern or northeastern projection, is kind of like upstate New York or Maine or Massachusetts. All right, so the vegetation and climate regimes are kind of the same over on this side of China. Okay, but as you progress inward, it gets drier and drier and drier. So again, here's how you learn about stuff on planet Earth. You know about the place that you're in, and you make associations now that I'm trying to make for you to another part of the planet you've never been. So having never been to China, but having been on the eastern seaboard of the United States, you should now know that, hey, you know, it's about right here. It's about the elevation of Blacksburg. And if you went south of here, uh, in China, it would be like going south of here in the United States. So the further south you go, it would get tropical and full on hot. And actually there's kind of tropical rainforest and monsoon regions of China way down on the southern fringe. But really this would be like the southeastern United States. And this would be like the northeastern United States. It would be a little bit cooler as you go this way. You go all the way up to the Manchurian Peninsula, it would be like upstate New York, like Buffalo, New York. Severe winters, a lot cooler, a lot of snow. So this whole side of China, much like this whole side of the United States. But, as I suggested, as you go into the interior of China, as you get away from the eastern side, it gets higher as a general rule. It also gets drier as a general rule. And you have this gigantic area up here is the Gobi Desert. And actually, this is the Taklamakan Basin over here, the Taklamakan Desert. And the Tibetan Plateau, as I already suggested, is ultra-high mountains. And they're really cold, but they don't get a lot of rainfall either. So you, as you go further and further in, drier and drier and drier and drier. Man, I'm so dry, I need a drink. Boom. Okay, so higher and drier as you progress east to west. Uh, and there are some major rivers as well, but they don't flow the same way that rivers mostly flow in the United States. In the United States, actually I should go back and say one more thing about vegetation and climate. The reason why uh, the climate differs in western China as opposed to western United States is we have another coast. Right? We got the west coast over there and big bodies of water modify and change climate and vegetation. So whereas as you progress in the United States and for go further and further west, it's just like China. It gets drier, right? You get to uh, the great basin areas in the United States or the, the deserts out there, uh, the, the deep west. Uh, and it can be very much like these parts of China as well, but eventually you bump back into the Pacific Ocean on the other coast of the United States where it's more moderated again and there's more rainfall and other types of climate and vegetation. Not so in China, because like, the West is locked in to the great Asian continent. 
So actually, if you just keep going uh, west, you're going to get into the grasslands and even drier areas of Central Asia. So that's the main difference between the United States and China climate-wise. But there's also a river difference. The big river systems in the United States, typically, thinking of the Mississippi especially, kind of flow north to south. Uh, in the uh, 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 most populated, most important parts of China, East Asian region, they flow west to east. So this way is a, the way that a lot of things have moved in the United States due to the waterways. Uh, and it's this way for China. In fact, I do want you to know, I know this seems like kind of baby shit, uh, uh, basic geography 101, but you know, China's really important in today's world, so it's good to know this stuff. I do want you to know kind of the couple, the couple three major rivers of China. The Yellow, the Yangtze, Yangtze, and the Xi. And they are major, major, major rivers of China, and they always have been. In fact, the Yellow is often called China's sorrow because it floods so frequently in times past, we're talking historical times like 1,000, 2,000 years ago, you may have had millions of people die in floods of the Yellow and the Yangtze. Uh, it's, they're just huge, powerful river systems, and millions and millions and millions of people live along the banks because these areas, as you see from the shaded relief, flow through the coastal lowlands, the flat plains, and this is the bread basket, one of the bread baskets of China. These rivers really are the lifeblood, the artery of China's agricultural regions, but also their commerce. And they are today, and they were 3,000 years ago too. So the yellow, this big one up here, flowing, whoa, kind of makes this pilgrim's hat here. The yellow river flowing out that way. Uh, the, uh, the Yangtze, okay, and Three Gorges Dam, if you've ever heard of that, it's right up here. Uh, flowing out to, uh, empties through Shanghai, and actually the Xi River, which flows out and empties near Hong Kong and Guangzhou. And all three of the areas that these rivers empty out at are major metropolitan urban centers. Just think about the volume, not just of the water that flows out through these rivers, but of the trade that goes up and down these rivers. These are all major port cities where these empty out. Again, the real lifeblood, the artery, the living arteries of the Chinese economy and its social life and history are these three major huge rivers. Okay, enough said about that. So again, the thing to consider physically is that movement in China historically and in today's world is, has been this way. Not north-south, but this way. Everything focusing movement of goods and services and agricultural products this way into this focused core area. And that core area, because of the river systems and the coastal plains, has always been the core area of Chinese civilization for, again, a couple, several thousand years. I'm sorry, let me go look up here. Epic Meal says, but how does the climate flows and how does the climate flow affect China versus the United States? I'm not sure I understand that question, Epic, epic Meals. Uh, maybe rephrase that one. Uh, anyway. So there are some differences, there are a lot of similarities physically on the eastern side of China to the eastern side of the United States, uh, but I'll point out some differences, and the peak patterns are definitely different as a result. I think I showed you this map uh, probably the very first day of class. Uh, on this map, every dot represents 100,000 Asian peoples. Okay, if we zoom into this map, just the Chinese one, each dot represents 100,000 Chinese people. Uh, and the pattern is pronounced, and you can see it. Where are all the peeps at? They're all on the eastern side. Why? For reasons which I've now outlined. That the eastern side of China is where there are conducive climates uh, and conducive soils for great agricultural production and big flat areas to build towns which turn into cities and huge metropolitan areas and because the way the rivers flow in that direction they've always focused again the kind of the uh, commerce of what's going on in this place up and down the river by the way these rivers are huge this is like a semi amazon semi mississippi size gigantic rivers that you go both ways and not just downstream so and you can actually see the river system just by the population map look at these big kind of phallic symbols going into the interior. Most people are on the coast, obviously. People piled on top of people, piled on top of people. Chinese dog pile on the east coast where 1.2 billion people are hanging out. Uh, but 
when you start to get to the interior, you see that, wow, there's kind of really focused areas where there are still millions and millions of people, and they're all focused around those three river systems that I've pointed out. As you continue to progress westward, though, look how the dots just disappear. Uh, there's just not a lot of folks outside of those river systems as you go west, and there are hardly anybody home in the Tibetan Plateau, uh, in the deep northwest, uh, in the Gobi Desert of Inner Mongolia. It's just a not heavily populated area, period. This country, maybe more so than any other place on the planet that I can think of off the top of my head, has just this absolute distinct east-west divide. People, no people. Urban, rural. Action, no action. I mean, it's really distinct, and that's why you really, and I actually say it in the textbook and for uh, my division of the region, say, you know, West China, it really doesn't got that much in common with East China. Yeah, it's in a singular political entity, sovereign state called China, but when you start to look at really anything going on, it's two different worlds housed within the same country which is why for our East Asia region, we're only going to talk about the eastern side of China, where 99% of the people are and 99% of the economic action is and 99% of everything is, including their history. Okay, So a distinct urban-rural divide between eastern and western China, distinct, huge, big time, Okay, that's you can see illustrated even better on this awesome lights at night. This map is in your book. Uh, of course, you can feel free to download this image. It's free. I think it's a compiled NASA image <clears throat> and have fun with it, projecting it on the, the uh, a wall of your dorm room with all the lights out while you have fun and check out the different patterns of people. And it's, sh and it's showing not just patterns of people, it's actually showing patterns of electricity, patterns of infrastructure, patterns of interaction. Patterns of economy. That's what this lights at night is really showing. If there's nobody there and there's nothing going on, there's no lights. And so if you just look at this image, zoom into it with your eyeballs, you see this whole idea that people are packed into the eastern seaboard side of China. That's illustrated once again. And look how Japan's lit up like a Christmas tree. It's packed full of people, but also heavy, heavy technology and infrastructure. But as you progress west, what, buddy, it's just lights out. It just lights out in China. Nobody home over in this direction, especially the big Tibetan plateau. You can still see this big football, but now it's a big dark football because there ain't nobody there. Uh, and this is also the Taklamakan Basin up here and the Gobi Desert. Lights out because not a lot of action going on. Okay. And again, that, you can see here's the, here's the lights at night and superimpose the people. Oh, the lights at night. Superimpose the people. One more time, lights at night, and then superimpose the people. It's a one-to-one -one scenario, right? Uh, and speaking of these people, uh, they ain't all Chinese. <laughs> I love making up words. Mac, uh, uh, Mac and uh, Chinese, Mac, Kraft Macaroni and Chinese. Uh, when you're thinking about the people of China, we often say, well, it's, they're Chinese people. And by and large, you'd be correct with that assumption. Most people in China are Chinese, ethnically Chinese. It's actually more appropriate and proper to say Han Chinese. Uh, Han is one of their most famous dynasties, one of their most famous historical periods that actually overlap the Roman uh, era, the Roman Empire in Western Europe. There was the Han Empire in China at the, roughly the same dates. It's just a complete coincidence, but that's how they rolled. Uh, and the Han was a really great era for China's history. So over the millennia, uh, they have simply started to refer to themselves as not just Chinese people, we're Han Chinese people. That's our actual ethnicity. But what I'm showing you with this map is there's other people there besides Han Chinese people. Okay, And they're in a minority, for sure. Put that in your brain. All groups that are not Han Chinese in China are minority groups to an exponent, like big time. And what I mean by that, it's I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's 92, 93, 95% Han Chinese people in China as a whole, leaving only 5 or 6 or 7 or 8% for all these other ethnic minorities. But I do want to point them out because they often make the news. And the minorities that I want to speak of are Mongolian folks, ethnically Mongol folks, that are all in Mongolia, but also a part of China called Inner Mongolia. Uh, the Uyghurs in this yellow area up here, 
these are folks that would actually identify their ethnicity that would they be tied more to Turkic his, historical background and Turkic uh, ancestry, not Chinese. Uh, and of course, the one you hear the most about is Tibetan. Tibetan people are ethnically Tibetan. They're not ethnically Han Chinese. Uh, and everybody knows this within China. Everybody's like, yeah, you're not in our group and you're not in this group. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, this Uyghur group here. I'm sorry, Kazakh was in yellow. The Uyghurs are over here uh, in Xinjiang province. So it's not all Chinese folks, but it's overwhelmingly Chinese folks. You see a little bit of Korean overbleed up here in this quadrant as well. Uh, and there are some ethnic minorities down south, maybe some Thais, maybe some Vietnamese, maybe some other folks uh, like the Hmong that are actually in southern China, but in very small numbers. Again, very small numbers in these ethnic groups. And even if there were millions of them, you have to keep it in perspective that there's 1.4 billion Chinese people. Uh, there's 1.4 billion people in China. So even if you had an ethnic group that had several million people in it, you're still a wild minority because of the size of the uh, Chinese population in total. Now again, I wanted to point this out because there are some issues that I know you've heard about. I know you've heard about Tibet. You know the Dalai Lama now, hopefully from the World, Re World Leaders exam. Uh, and the whole Tibetan issue is still a very active and very much hot button issue in today's Tibet. Uh, now this is a story from last year, but I could have put up a, pretty much the same story from a month ago. And that is there continue to be Tibetan people that catch themselves on fire, they're typically Buddhist monks, uh, in protest of being part of China or in protest of not having equal rights in China. Uh, the Dalai Lama, for his part, for his whole life has said, look, we're, we're in the Tibetan autonomous region and we just want to have more rights and be able to have more limited government in our autonomous region. We're not asking for independence. Uh, and the Chinese leadership for, I don't know, 60 years has said, bullshit. And you should know that for the exam, the Chinese leadership absolutely despises the Dalai Lama. I think I told you this already, but I'll tell you again. Uh, they are convinced that any protest, including monks setting themselves on fire, or any talk of any more rights or anything else for Tibetan people, the Chinese central government considers that as radical slash terrorists slash revolutionaries who are trying to rip Tibet away from China proper. That is the official government take, it's uh, Hu Jintao's take, it's Wen Jiabao's take, and I do want you to know this, and you can ask your Chinese friends, I'm not picking on them, I'm just telling you I want you to understand this, most Chinese people, and I mean most Chinese people, most of 1.4 billion, do believe that the Dalai Lama is a terrorist and that Tibet is trying to pull itself away. That's what they have been taught in their textbooks, that's how their news has interpreted the events that happened in Tibet, and that's what they believe, and that's that. So you, we can love the uh, Dalai Lama from the outside, but don't think for a second that most Chinese people do, because they don't. Okay, And that's, again, different group. They're not Han Chinese, they're Tibetan folks. Sorry, I got a question up here from Nikki172 that says, are there enough people in Tibet to make that a separate state if they broke away from China? Uh, no. Well, I, as we talked about, what does it take to make a state? And people's never really part of the equation. However, you can Google this, Wikipedia it. You can find out how many people are in Tibet that, that identify themselves as ethnically Tibetan. And I'm thinking it's a couple million tops. You can write back on your chat window and tell me if I'm wrong. It's not a lot of folks. Remember, the whole western side of China is very sparsely populated to begin with. So there's not a lot of Tibetans. There's not a lot of Uyghurs. There's not a lot of Mongolians over in the western part of China. There's not a lot of anybody. Uh, and even if at some point in the near or distant future, the whole world decided to recognize Tibet, uh, China, of course, would veto it, wouldn't let it happen. But China can also now say this. They can look at the whole world and say, what are you talking about we should free Tibet? Go look at the population dynamics. It's mostly Han Chinese people. And they would be correct because China has had a policy of facilitating and encouraging Han Chinese people to move to Tibet for the last five decades. And we are now at a point that I believe demographically there now may be more ethnically Han Chinese people in Tibet than Tibetan people in Tibet. So China can say, very legitimately, what do you mean free Tibet? It's mostly Chinese people. That's part of China. Mission accomplished. Okay? Uh, and I think that answered someone else's question as well. Okay? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Amada says, uh, is Tibetan people what want their own state and ruled by religion theocracy state? 
Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to that one, Amada. There has been speculation in the past that under the Dalai Lama and the uh, Buddhist order that it was a theocracy. There's actually a whole lot of Chinese reports out there that say that this was a, a feudal state, that the Buddhist monks controlled everything, uh, and that the people were impoverished, and so actually China coming in to liberate them from this system was a good thing. Uh, most Chinese people know that story, and they'll tell you all about it and say it's 100% true. The Tibetan people have a different take on it and say, well, no, we didn't need to be saved by the Chinese, and this is just our history and our religion. This is how it rolls here. So again, a very complicated issue. I'll leave it to you to go research some more to find out which side of the story you want to support and believe in. Let me get to some other ethnic groups, though. Tibet's the one you hear about all the time because the Dalai Lama is a world figure. Uh, and there is this idea that maybe there would be a free Tibet because that's why people put bumper stickers on their car. Uh, by the way, side note, it ain't never going to happen. Sorry. Sorry, Tibet. Love you, Dalai Lama. Love you, Tibetans. But uh, it, it will never in our lifetimes, if ever, be a free Tibet. It will be an autonomous, semi-autonomous region of China. China is now too powerful for, for anything else to happen. Let me get to some other ethnic groups, though, because it's not just the Tibetans. Uh, there are Inner Mongolians. I'm sorry. There are Mongolians in this also autonomous region called Inner Mongolia, all right? Inner Mongolia is a state of China, uh, but it does have Mongolian people in it. And this has become a, 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 a dicey, frictional issue just in the last year because several people have been killed in accidents, not on purpose, but Chinese truck drivers or Chinese construction workers or the Chinese government buildings, uh, you know, a, a project or a road have accidentally killed a Mongolian person. Uh, and the last time it happened, it was like a little girl that got run over by a Chinese cement truck or something. And people get outraged. And they're like, dude, we're a minority and our government's picking on us and this sucks. And people take to the streets and riot. And this has happened several times in Inner Mongolia. By the way, that's new. That, that, Inner Mongolia has been pretty quiet for most of the last 50 years, but... As the China's population grows, as the government encourages investment and economic growth over into its western side, now you're having people come into contact with these minority groups and friction does ensue sometimes. And speaking of which, is the last one I will mention, I do want you to know, uh, and that is the Uyghur group up in the Xinjiang province. This is one that's actually been hotter than even the Tibetan issue. Uh, and as I suggested, the Uyghur folks up in Xinjiang, not only are they not Chinese at all, uh, they would trace their origin and ancestry and lineage back to Turkic roots. So they actually speak a whole different language. And they also happen to be Muslim, which means they're a whole different religion. They, they're really culturally and socially 100% different than everybody else in China. Uh, and they sometimes feel like, hey, we're getting picked on, we're a minority group, the government doesn't care about us, we don't have rights, we can't get bank loans, and probably some of that is true. Uh, and the Chinese government says, oh, well, we're trying to help, we're trying to fix it, but there's lots of terrorist Uyghurs who want a free Uyghur state who are trying to rip Xinjiang away from us, and that's not going to happen either. So there's been plenty of cases of stuff going bad in Xinjiang province, uh, and protests happening and cars getting flipped over and build buildings getting burned down and the Chinese government comes in and you'll just have a news blackout when that happens. You won't hear nothing. Uh, it's so deep in the interior of western China, not a lot of foreign reporting goes on in China period, but certainly not this deep in. And so when you'll, you know something bad's happening in Xinjiang when suddenly you don't hear nothing about Xinjiang. <laughs> that means the troop, Chinese troops have been sent in to put down any protest, and it's a news blackout. And again, the Chinese, this feels like a test question too, say, oh, by the way, uh, this is a good thing we're doing. Because whenever the United States got attacked on September uh, 2001, two states actually came forward and said, we feel really bad and we want to help you out. The United States said, okay, terrorists just struck the U.S., and we're going to have a war on terror, and we're going to go defeat terrorism everywhere. Who will help us in this fight to destroy terrorists? And two countries jumped up immediately and said, we'll help, we'll help, we'll help. We got it, we got it. Do you, does anybody know what countries were the first to join? Maybe I talked about this in class already, but let me go ahead and give you the answer. I'll pull the trigger, uh, pun intended. Uh, Russia and China. 
Russia and China immediately said, yep, no, we have no problem. Well, we will definitely help on the war on terrorism because we have Islamic terrorists in our countries that we've already been killing for years. Uh, Russia has, uh, had been already in an eight-year war with Chechen rebels, who just happened to be Islamic, and China, Cheching in Xinjiang, say, oh, yep, we have Muslim separatist terrorists there as well, and we've been fighting them for a decade, so we totally feel your pain in the United States, and we got your back. We are all fighting the war on terror, but it's slightly different. Okay? To the Chinese government, they look at it the same way. Just so you know, different, different uh, uh, smaller ethnic groups in Western China in particular that do cause a lot of headaches for the central government of China, but it goes to reinforce this idea that there's really two Chinas, Western and Eastern, extremely, extremely different. Okay. But of course, we're looking at the whole region here. Uh, and we could back it up and say, all right, well, Boyers have just been talking about China thus far and differences in East to West in China. You also should know that we're including the Koreas in this region, and Koreans are not ethnically Han Chinese. And you know what? Let's go uh, to the next region over, Japan. Uh, Japanese people ain't ethnically Han Chinese. In fact, a good way to get your teeth kicked in anywhere in Asia is to mistake uh, uh, Asians for other Asians and walk around Beijing and say, hey, uh, are you just a Japanese dude? Because you look like a Japanese dude, especially right now that China and Japan are in full-on hate against each other. That's a good way to get a smackdown. But you should also know there's severe animosity between Koreans and Japanese, and Japanese and Chinese, and sometimes Chinese and Koreans. So uh, even on the fringes of this region, there are different ethnicities, different histories that sometimes cause problems between them. Again, we're living through a semester in particular with the Senkaku Islands slash the Ayu Islands being disputed over between China and Japan that's causing a lot of open friction and hostility and possibly war. Although I think it's been kind of chilling out a little bit since the big water cannon fight a couple weeks ago. All right, let's get on to it though. Let's see what you've now learned in the last 45 minutes of lecture about Chinese peoples. Uh, their climates, their vegetations, and maybe even can pick out some things from the wider region. Uh, by doing this, we're going to do this by saying a playing game called Where in China Are We? Oh, look, so adorable. Where are we, Mama? I don't know where those people are. They're just Chinese people. They could be anywhere in China, but they're likely in eastern China, right? So, for all of the following pictures, I'll show you the picture and you scream out as loudly as possible wherever you are. Is this uh, North China, South China, East China, West China? And let's see if you can do even better than that. Can you tell me if it's Northeast or Northwest, Southeast or Southwest China? I don't know. Let's play the game very quickly, and then I'll point out exactly what states they're in as we go. Here we go, picture one. Where do you think you'd see a picture like this in China? If you guessed Northwestern, I'm sorry, Northeastern China, you'd be exactly right. Up in here, Longyang province, which again would be even further north than Maine, maybe it'd be like in uh, Canada, uh, and they get severe amounts of snow up there. Again, it's just kind of like Buffalo, New York, upstate New York. Uh, good ski areas, I assume, up there if they have any mountains, but pretty harsh climate when you get that far north up in here, Longyang. How about this picture? Where do you think this one was taken? Did you guess perhaps deep northwest? That'd be a great guess. And that would be in the Taklamakan Desert, in the Taklamakan Basin, in the Xinjiang province, the province I pointed out to you earlier that has the Uyghur ethnic group in it as well. Now, how about this pic? Oh, this one. <laughs> Only thing we can say for sure, it's somewhere in the east. If you can't figure out what this is, you can put your eyeballs closer to the screen. Uh, it's a swimming pool. <laughs> you ever been to a swimming pool like that before with that many people? You can see a Ferris wheel in the background. So we're definitely in an urban area, heavily, heavily populated, and that can only be eastern China. I don't know if it's southeast, I don't know if it's northeast, but it's eastern coastal China for sure. And by the way, this is a picture that's a part of four different pictures. This is of a panorama around this entire gigantic stadium slash swimming pool amusement park. Boy, doesn't that look like fun, and I wonder how much Chinese pee is in that pool right there. Oh, and did I go there? Yes, I did, but I wouldn't go in that pool. How about, oh, I'm sorry, this is in Hebei province, actually. Hebei, which is the whole state surrounding uh, Beijing. Uh, it, you know, Beijing's packed, and so is Hebei. 
Let's go to this picture. Hmm. Can you see any clues that might tip you off where this would be? What you're looking for is those rice patties. Look at all that water, that, that locked in water in a wet rice paddy situation, but I see an urban area in the background, and I see a big trucking center in the foreground. So again, we're somewhere in a heavily populated area, in an urban area, maybe a port city, but it's tropical climate because of those wet rice paddies. And actually, it's down in Guangdong, in the deep southeast. Remember, southeastern China would much be much like southeastern United States, thinking about the four seasons and hot summers and a lot wetter, say down in the Florida, like the Everglades. Well, that's what it is down in Guangzhou, uh, Guangdong province. Pretty tropical, pretty hot. Almost borderline doesn't have four seasons, getting full on tropical like it's hot all the time. I pointed out Guangzhou in particular because it's one of the most hustling, bustling states in China. All the uh, eastern seaboard states are titanically awesome and hustling and bustling. Guangdong has been like that for, I don't know, uh, 2,000 years. Guangdong is the state that has uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangzhou in it. You've heard of Hong Kong, hopefully you've heard about Macau. Guangzhou is one you probably haven't heard about, but these are all major port cities uh, that have been major port cities for a couple millennia, that have been the centers of tea and rice and silk trade, or ever, and even porcelain trade. So everybody in the world, even a thousand years ago, knows, knew where Guangzhou was because it was a major, major, major trade center. And this is the climate and vegetation of the surrounding area. How about this picture? This is a little tougher because you can't see. I see some mountains in the background, but you can't see much more. It's the people you're looking at here. Now, if you're from China, you probably got this immediately. You're like, that ain't Chinese people. Uh, they're not. Those are Mongolian people. This is from Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region. Uh, and it was the riding the horses and the people in their costumes that would give it away if you actually know a little bit about the folks and the traditions in this area. How about this one? It's another tough one. It's another tough one. You probably can't narrow it down too much except if you see the little hills in the background. You remember back when I said this is an urban area, obviously, and there's a lot of building and they're building a high rise right there. So it's in the east for sure. Uh, but those little hills and mountains about the size of the Appalachians should have tip it off and, and, and clue you in that it's down in the Hunan district, down in southeastern China, but a little further inland where it gets a little hilly. Starts to creep into the bigger mountains as you further progress west. Let's go to this picture. Oh, oh, oh. I wonder where that's at. This is easy. If you've ever been to China, or even if you haven't, look at the buildings. This is a definite tip-off is the architecture here. That ain't Chinese architecture. And it's a port city, obviously. That's European architecture. It almost looks British. Where could we go in a port city somewhere in China that have a ton of British influence or international European influence? Well, there's a couple of choices. Hong Kong would be one, but this is actually Shanghai, the Shanghai waterfront, uh, where, again, for the last several hundred years, you've had a lot of European influence, Hong Kong and Macau were actually European full-on colonies at one point, but Shanghai was a very international European-controlled city for several hundred years. We'll get to that here in the next uh, hour of lecture as we talk about the history of China. Let's move on to this one, though. Where would this be? Well, if you know where the Great Wall of China is, it's up north. And because of the barrenness of the mountains, I'm going to guess it's probably north-central, probably near the Gobi Desert. Uh, yeah, Shangxi province. Uh, it has, gets mountainous up in the north, uh, and it is on the fringe of the Gobi. If you kept going over these mountains, you'd get to Inner Mongolia and then to full-on Mongolia where the Gobi is. Let's go to this one. Oh, I don't even know where this one is. This is a big question mark. What I always point out to students with this is, it's not so much that we can have a clue of where this is, but we can probably figure out when it was built. And what I mean by that is, isn't this the most communist-looking damn city landscape you've ever seen? <laughs> this is the most utilitarian, communist, Marxist, utopia landscape. Everything looks the same. The whole damn city looks like it was built with Legos. And so I have no idea where it's at. It's definitely in the east because it's a heavily populated urban area. But we can say for sure that it was built during the communist heyday when they were all proud of their utilitarian, featureless uh, 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 cityscapes. So somewhere in the east, perhaps if you're from China and you actually know what the city is, chime it in because I have no clue. Uh, but definitely in the east, 
and definitely probably a city, a manufactured planned city from the 1960s or 70s in the heyday of the communist control era. All right, where does this one at then? <laughs> oh, well, uh, again, you can kind of look at the people uh, and the desert uh, climate behind them and the use of a camel. Got to be closing in on Central Asia somewhere because them ain't Chinese people and this is deep desert uh, and this is the Gansu province on the fringe of the Gobi Desert, on the fringe of Inner Mongolia and with the Shangxi province. So pretty deep almost into Central Asia with these two cats hanging out on a camel. Oh, how about this one? We're back to some rice paddy, some intense paddy production. Probably a triple crop this year in this particular climate because it's hot and it's wet and it, it's hot all the time so they can grow rice all the time. And here's another shot. Look how beautiful these things are. Just gorgeous, gorgeous landscape. Um, it is a d indeed back down in the south, borderline full on tropical monsoon type climates. It's approaching tropical latitudes way down south in the Yunnan district. Uh, this is one of the bread baskets of China and rice, of course. I love this picture. I wanted to show you this. Dude, isn't that such a cool landscape? It's like a moon landscape hanging out on the water buffalo on. Uh, and uh, down south, they can get several crop rotations, maybe three in full-on tropical areas of rice. But rice is produced everywhere in China, uh, all along both big river banks uh, of the uh, Yellow and the Huanghe. I'm sorry, the yellow and the Yangtze. And uh, I do want you to know, probable test question, uh, that rice is referred to as the dragon's backbone. I wonder why that would be, the dragon's backbone. Oh yeah, uh, because China's the biggest producer of rice on planet Earth. China's the biggest consumer of rice on planet Earth. Uh, most Chinese people eat rice pretty much every day. You would not have this civilization and this gigantic population without having the massive amounts of rice production that they have had. Uh, 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 2,000 years ago and even today. Uh, a fun side note, the United States actually exports rice to China. What? Why, why would we be a major rice exporter? Because uh, we don't eat the shit. So we're actually one of the biggest rice exporters on the planet. Can you imagine that? The United States is one of the biggest rice exporters on the planet. Do we make as much as China? Hell no! We don't make anywhere near as much as China. But all they make they eat, and then they need more. They're hungry. So we send them ours because we don't eat that crap. Okay. Sorry, I have ignored questions for too long. Uh, other than the location of the islands, is there any value to them? I've lost the, I've lost the thread on that. The location of the islands. Are you talking about this, the islands itself? East Asian islands, between Japan and China. Were you talking about that earlier? You know? I don't remember the island reference. Uh, Scottish are put forward independence, someone says. In the Tibet, I've already answered that one. Uh, Tibet, I've already answered that one. Uh, and, oh, I like what Epic Neal says. Uh, is rice to China like corn to us? Yes, that's excellent. You know, Epic Meals, I like that so much, I think I'm going to make that a flash quiz question. Rice is to China like corn is to us, or the U.S. So, blank is to China as corn is to U.S., or... A rice is to China as blank as the U.S. Fill in the blank. You're absolutely right. It's a staple crop. It's a staple crop they grow tons of, and it's the basis for not just eating it straight, but it's the basis for you know breads and pastas and and virtually everything in Chinese cuisine. So yeah, rice is a huge, huge deal. Kind of like corn is to the Americas. Good call on that. Epic meals. You have an appropriate screen name with a food shout out. All right, so dragon's backbone of China, rice. How about this picture? Where do you think this is from? Uh, and this shot is another great wall shot, but it's obviously in a full-on desert area, and it is in Inner Mongolia. So we're back to the uh, uh, Inner Mongolia. I just love Inner Mongolia. I want to go party there. So I guess I keep showing pictures because I really want to chill with some Mongolians in Inner Mongolia. How about this pic? Now we're getting very distinctive. There is only one part of China that's going to have mountains that look that freaking huge that are snow-capped, and that would be, correct, the Tibetan Autonomous Region there in the southwestern side of China, the southwestern quadrant, okay? Uh, here's just a few other landscape shots from our tour of the greater China area. Great Wall of China, just outside Beijing. So the Great Wall actually stretches pieces of it back and forth, stretches uh, a couple thousand miles. So you can get great different landscape shots, in some in desert, some in forest, some in scrubland. And this is one that's just north of Beijing. 
Uh, and let's get a little further afield. This is Jeju Island, South Korea. South Korea is a, is a climate very similar to Virginia, actually, maybe even a, a, a little further north with the four seasons and everything. But this Jeju Island, I believe, is on the north coast, and it's supposed to be a paradise. It's a vacation island people go party at. Here's Hong Kong. I definitely did want to show you Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is not like uh, Manhattan. It's not all like a single city, all concentrated with water around it. Hong Kong is actually a city that's uh, a city around water. So you see big high-rise buildings all around, peppered around these different islands uh, in what is becoming the biggest port city on planet Earth. I don't know if it's already true, but I think it is that Hong Kong now ships has more traffic and more cargo flow through it every day than any other place on planet Earth. And if you had to pick a single city in Asia to compare to New York, it would be Hong Kong. Feels like another... Uh, test question. Hong Kong really is the New York of Asia. I mean, when we think of New York, you know, LA's a big city, and, you know, Miami Beach, Miami's a big city, but when you say New York, that's Gotham, man, Gotham. That's the action, that's the center, that's where everything's happening. And that's what Hong Kong is to Asia, big time. Uh, and on top of that, they're a huge center of trade. This tr I don't know how many millions of cargo whole, uh, uh, containers go through that place every day. It's massive. Uh, one more shot of Tibet province, western China. Again, it's high mountains uh, and it's mostly a very arid area. Even though you think it's like, oh, it's covered with snow, so it's lots of water. No, it's pretty dry. It's just so cold when it snows, it doesn't melt. Uh, oh, this is a beautiful uh, uh, picture. You'll often see this in lots of classic Chinese art. Uh, uh, watercolors and everything like that and it's a very distinctive karst landscape for those of you that know your geology it's a, I believe it's a karst based landscape uh, in the Yellow Mountains in Anhui province over in eastern China uh, it really mystical cool looking place by all means everybody should go party there uh, and here's uh, Beijing I've intentionally kind of waited for the last because Beijing you, is like any other big city at this point but it's a big city that has been often on the capital of this place for a long, long time. So it has things like the Forbidden City in the interior of it. It used to be the, the seat of the imperial power with all the pomp and circumstance of all that. So Beijing is kind of like a London and a Paris and, and a, a little bit of New York all wrapped into one in terms of its historical and current importance, obviously, as the capital of China right this second. Uh, and it's not monolithic, it's a big city, it has great historical treasures in it, uh, but it's vibrant and it's happening and there's huge shop shopping centers and you know, I don't even know how many, 20, 30, 50, 60 million people hanging out in the greater Beijing area. This city is alive day and night, it's happening and these people are getting richer and they're spending more money and so there's more shops going in and more activity and it's happening in place and because of all that, you also get to see this if you go to Beijing. Here's a... Well, 12 hour time lapse difference of the deteriorating air quality. Now, Beijing is now known as one of the worst smog cities on planet Earth. In fact, the Chinese government considers it such an embarrassment that they have forbidden anyone besides the official Chinese government from reporting on air quality from Beijing. Now, how they're going to stop that, nobody knows, but that's what they're saying they're going to do. It's against the law to talk about air in Beijing because that's how ass nasty it looks sometimes. All right. Oh, here's uh, just a couple more. Uh, Namsan, which is a district of Seoul, South Korea. Seoul is a happening, happening, happening place as well. Pretty much all of South Korea is one kind of big urban agglomerate that's just like Beijing. It's happening. It's bustling. It's growing. It's, it looks like, you know, brand new westernized cities. It, it's no difference between that and, you know, Milan, Italy or Paris, France anymore. It's, it's alive and it's brand new and new buildings going up all the time. Uh, and I did want to point out, I think maybe I did, that uh, South Korea in particular, it's very similar in latitude to where we're at here in Virginia, maybe a little further north. Uh, and they have four seasons just like we do. Most of China, uh, the eastern seaboard of China has four seasons like we do, until you, until you get too far south down to full-on tropical areas, or too far north into kind of more arctic areas. But most of this area, four seasons just like us. Eastern side, not western side of China. Uh, and so there's uh, Korea, uh, and one last one, this is rush hour in North Korea. <laughs> North Korea actually has a 
much more brutal climate. They've been getting hammered by bad floods and really horrific freezes for decades, I think maybe as in retribution punishment to the poor leadership, but it's one of the reasons why the place sucks so bad. Uh, and it's a really tough to eke out a living in North Korea. But let's get out of that and get on to the second big thing you need to know about China. Big differences between East and West. Got that, no worries there. Uh, thing two, China has forever been a world power, fiercely independent, and borderline isolationist, okay? Meaning it is truly one of the unique, epic world cultures in its own right. I hadn't really even thought about this until I'm now speaking out loud. This often happens when I'm talking only to a camera. Um, that when we think of Western Europe, or we think of European civilization, European culture, that's the basis for Western civilization, right? You go back in, what does it mean to be the West? And what are, what are the United States' and even Latin America's historic ties to? And it's, we're all part of Western civilization. And the roots for all that are back in the old world, back in Europe. China is like that for everything on that side of the whole Eurasian continent. India's a, a bit different too, no, no doubts about that. In, India's in its own category of unique culture. But China really is so wildly unique, so wildly different, and evolved completely, you know, its own everything, that it's the center of Asian culture. And I don't want to offend any of my Japanese, Korean, or Taiwanese friends, or even Southeast Asian friends, but I think you'll kind of agree. When you think about China, uh, it's forever been this world power, and it's very unique. And unique what? We think of, you know, the dragon and, and the terracotta soldiers from 25... 100 years ago, and the, the imperial line and the dynasties, and their ruling styles, and their emperors, and their architecture is very is different from uh, the West. And food, Chinese food, we think of, of course, there's Chinese, I've been to a Chinese restaurants, very unique. But what you're not thinking of is even deeper. Writing styles of uh, uh, calligraphy, and, and the way that they write with characters instead of letters like they do in the West, that started in China. Uh, their philosophies and ruling systems are very unique. They have philosophies, Eastern philosophies, that aren't the same as Western philosophies. We have a lot of uh, things like Christianity or Islam, the religious-based things that say, hey, here's how you should behave and here's how you should act. And in China, they have a Taoism and Confucianism. And they said, well, here's how you should behave and here's how you should act. Different worlds. Western Europe, the core, or Europe, the core of Western civilization, China, the core of Eastern civilization. We'll get to India later, okay, because it's pretty unique in its own right. Uh, and I own these out the fun stuff, even like Kung Fu. I mean, we, when you think of China as you know, several thousand years of all these unique traditions and holidays and festivals and arts and it's all China, and they have, they're the ones that invented martial arts. And, and let me get back to this. Sorry, I, I lost track of my brain for a second. I didn't want to offend all my other Asian friends, but when you think about ja uh, Japanese writing styles, or Japanese martial arts, or or you know even Korean martial arts, or Korean pottery, or Korean uh, this or that or the other, it is unique from China's art and martial arts and other things, but. China is the wellspring from which most of that stuff comes. And what I mean by that is the Chinese uh, several thousand years ago or 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago were evolving out these systems and then things diffuse out from them to other parts of Asia. There's a reason why when we look at, say, Japanese writing or Chinese writing, we can't tell the difference or Korean writing. So to Western eyes, we're like, hell, it all looks like a bunch of squiggles to us. We don't know. It looks all the same. Uh, it's different. There's Korean writing style, Japanese writing style, and, and, and Chinese writing style, but China was, came first. And China's influenced the others. And the same is true with philosophy, okay? And the same is true with the arts. And the same is true with martial arts. And the same is true with food. So everybody has their own unique thing, but China certainly is the wellspring. They've been around the longest. They're the anchor of East Asian and greater Asian culture. Again, when I say Asia, just keep excluding India. They're, they're separate for reasons we'll talk about later. China is the world's oldest continuous state. Maybe four to 5,000 year history, depending on which history books you want to look at. The Chinese history books typically put it at the 5,000 mark. Uh, and they made up a lot of older dynasties. That we said, oh, we don't really have written, this is before written records, but we had these guys, this emperor was in charge, and they did this, and we had these 
awesome kung fu battles and lots of other crazy stuff. It's mythology, okay? All, all societies and cultures make up their mythology. China's made theirs up a lot longer than anybody else. Uh, but certainly, since you started having the written word and documentation, we're looking at a society that's easily three to 4,000 years old. And when I say continuous, the shape of their state has fluctuated wildly over the course of the last 3,000 years, but it's always kind of been there. It's always kind of been in the same place. There's always been something that's distinctly Chinese, and the, and the Chinese people get it, and they understand it. They say, we're different. We're distinct. We ain't Vietnamese. We ain't Korean. We're China. We're the center of the world. This is China, all right? And when I said they're semi-isolationists, they're very fiercely proud and independent because, again, they're the wellspring of a lot of Asian culture. Uh, and semi-isolationist, meaning they weren't, they didn't seal themselves off from the world like North Korea has done. But they have said, uh, you know, we know there's Europeans over there. Uh, we know Australia is down there. We've been trading with the Indians for a thousand years. But we sell them our stuff. We're not interested in their stuff. You come here for ideas. We don't need yours. So that's the kind of isolationism I'm talking about. Not full on no contact, but more of a almost egotistical, we got the best shizzle going on here. So you can come take a taste, uh, but we don't really need any of your stuff. Now, for this several thousand year run of an imperial line, that is emperors, in control of this state politically and militarily. Uh, it's been their history. They're based on authoritarian regimes. So I know a lot of people like, oh, all these Chinese people want to have democracy right now. They're, they're yearning for freedom. Well, not really. Uh, I always say if 1.4 billion Chinese people wanted democracy, I think 1.4 billion people probably get democracy. In fact, what is it that 1.4 billion people want that they won't get? They pretty much have anything they want. They're 1.4 billion damn people. So the point is, yes, there are some folks in China that probably like democracy, and there are some folks that may be wanting more rights and maybe more voice in their government or more voice in their own personal lives. But it hasn't really come forward as a mass movement thing yet. And there's a historical reason for that. Historically, China has had authoritarian regimes. The, one, the current communist one-party state that runs China. It's just a, a new, the newest iteration of emperor. And they've always had it. This is always how it's run. And maybe with 1.4 billion people, maybe that's the best system they think to do. Do you really want democracy in 1.4 billion people? Well, India somehow pulls it off, but China really hasn't dabbled in that. They've experimented with that, and they haven't historically. So I just want you to think about that. Keep that in your mindset when you're trying to understand. Is there going to be some sort of revolution in China? I don't know but there hasn't historically. It's mostly been in the past that one regime really starts to suck, so another regime tries to take over and replace it. Not really, hey, we're all yearning for human rights or we're yearning for political freedom. That's just not in their cards, or it has not been in the past. We can't predict the future, obviously. Historically, historically, China has been a center of technology and innovation. Uh, they may be getting that title back, and that's really the whole focus of this talk, is they're coming back to retake their place in the world society. They've always been a center of technology and innovation. I know you've heard trivial things like the Chinese invented gunpowder. They did. They made fireworks out of them. Uh, the, the Europeans came and borrowed the gunpowder and made tanks out of them. So I guess hoorah for the uh, Europeans. Uh, but the Chinese invented paper. The Chinese originally invented clocks and water power and, and, and were mining oil 100 or 200 years before there was anybody in the Middle East who even knew what oil was. So the Chinese have always kind of been ahead of the game on a lot of these things. And not just for what we consider technology, but for the arts and martial arts and everything else. Yeah. Someone's asking, how did China, Chinese government deal with the Beijing Olympics so they don't want people to talk about the pollution? Someone asks, how did China deal with the Beijing Olympics uh, since they didn't want anybody talking about the pollution? Well, I don't know if you remember, but there were some athletes that just said, I, I can't run, I cannot breathe, I cannot do this. So with all the international press there and the international visitors, they couldn't do much about the Olympics. Uh, this is only recently, like in the last couple months, I've heard this because there's been a lot of people reporting about the horrific quality of Beijing air from their own embassies and people are blogging about it and people are setting up their own equipment. So it's just been a recent innovation 
that the Chinese government has said, yes, we want to shut this down. We don't want people, you know, bad mouthing our city or our government because we got it under control. Don't worry about it. Uh, during the Olympics, though, it was a slight problem. But you know, that's the thing about an authoritarian regime. They can control everything, and they do. Uh, they can control the press. They do. Uh, they do control what gets reported on. They do control the internet to a certain degree. Anybody who's smart enough to hack around it can do it, but not, not all billion Chinese people do it. So they can limit and control information, and the governments do it fairly well. They've done it fairly well in the past. They're doing it pretty well right now. No one knows how much longer they can keep doing it, but they're doing it okay right now. It's all a balance. It's all a balance of the Chinese government. In fact, this feels like a test question. The one thing the Chinese government fears above all other things is instability. They are terrified of instability, and they'll do anything to keep things chill. So even with economic growth, economic growth is awesome. Oh, we have awesome economic growth. Oh, it's getting out of control. Inflation is going to get too high. Oh, oh, slow it down, slow it down. We like stability. We would rather have a slower or a lower chill growth rate than an explosive growth rate. Same thing politically. Yeah, yeah, we might open up some things and let people have some freedoms, but we're not going to go gangbusters. We're not going to let people do whatever they want because we can't predict what's going to happen, and we don't like instability. We don't like things we can't predict. We like conservative values and everything's chill, and we kind of know what's around the corner. Uh, that's, a, that's the way the current government uh, reigns. That's the way the governments a 1,000 years ago in China reigned. And in fact, there are, the reason that a lot of Chinese dynasties eventually collapsed was because they couldn't control things, because, they, because there was too much instability. They couldn't get a handle on it. Uh, and even things like natural disasters. A natural disaster in China happens, and this is true in today's world. If an earthquake happens in you know, uh, Yunnan province, a Wen Jiabao and Hu Jintao will be down there within one hour. They're Johnny on the spot. Uh, because they want to be there to say, hey, no, no, the government says, oh, no, no, no. I mean, we can't control the earthquake, but we're here to do everything we can to stabilize, to get everything chill, come on, everything's cool, government's looking out for you. That's their role. Uh, and I pick on natural disasters in particular because it's been natural disasters in the past in Chinese history that have led to the collapse of some dynasties. That, you know, maybe their rule was not very good, and maybe taxes were too high, and, uh, and then a drought happened. And then people starved, and the people were like, oh, that's it. Our government doesn't have legitimacy anymore. Oh, then an earthquake happened. Nope, that's a bad omen. That's a bad sign. This government sucks. Overthrow them. Time for a new dynasty. So natural disasters and instability and everything that goes with that, the Chinese government works very hard to make sure that it's as chill as possible. That make sense? Okay. Uh, well, actually, I, was all, I got off tangent there. I was talking about how they're historically... I'm sorry, do you have a question? Is there, okay. I uh, someone drew, drew Noble asked what happened in Tiananmen Square again. We'll get to Tiananmen by the end of this lecture, which probably is not going to happen tonight, but we'll give it a go. Uh, and possible Chinese would be, no, 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 the Tibet I've already answered. Uh, how they report, da, 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 da. Who the hell allowed Olympics to happen in Beijing? Uh, there's an Olympic Council that decides on that and different cities and countries bid on it every year or in the four-year cycle and cities and countries work really hard to get them there so uh, you know that I'm glad you brought that up uh, epic you, maybe this is another test question too that 2008 Olympics in Beijing was really China's coming out party and that's what it was called by everybody and no China's not uh, uh, gay they're not that kind of coming out uh, it was their coming out party that they were announcing themselves as a world power again saying, hey, by the way, uh, we're back, uh, we're powerful, we're rich, and we are a big boy country that hosts the Olympics, and we win them too, because they did win the Olympics that year. Probably because all their athletes had an advantage of training in the smog. Sorry, China. Uh, all right, uh, let me get back to, historically, a center of technology and innovation. Uh, that's true then, and it's becoming true again. When all of the greatest artists in the world, or uh, musicians, or scribes, or philosophers, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, if you wanted to find out, hey, where's the real action happening? Where are the new ideas? Where's the newest technologies? Who is at the top of the game of pottery and textile production? If you were anywhere in the world, people would say, oh, China. Oh, you got to go to China. And, I mean, 2,000 years ago, people would say, oh, you probably need to go over to the Han Dynasty, man. It's happening there. They got this Buddhism thing going on, and they make these awesome silks. And 
it's always been a center of technology and innovation, always. Uh, you don't think about it too much because they had a, a, a period of laxness for a couple hundred years, and I'm going to get to that story in a minute. But pretty much for all of human history, it's the place to go when you want to see the greatest musicians or see uh, or learn from the greatest masters of technology or crafts. You go to China. Uh, historically, the center of the action is what I'm trying to encapsulate here. Historically, they're the shizzle. In fact, let me go through this very quickly because I know we're already like an hour late on this lecture. Write this down as fast as you can. I'm just going to go through this extremely quickly. Or you can just stop the, uh, uh, the, the podcast and write them down later. But here are Asian world history you must absolutely know. Okay, you absolutely must know this, for exam. And I'm going to go through it in like 30 seconds. You ready? We're going to go back in time. Uh, 1000 BC. 1000 BC, uh, China is the shit. Uh, 500 BC, uh, China is the shit. Uh, 0 AD, Jesus is born. China is the shit. Uh, 500 AD, now AD, China is the shit. 1000 AD, China is the shit. Uh, 1100 AD, China is the shit. At 1300s AD, uh, the Mongols invade China. They bust, uh, uh, bust asses and take over China. And, and despite that, China is still the shit. Uh, 1400, China is the shit. Uh, 1500 is when the Europeans come out of their dark ages and finally start doing something. And the something they do is start going to take over the whole rest of the world. But China is still the shit at that time. Uh, in 1600, uh, China is the shit, and the Manchus achieve the largest territorial extent. By the way, for those of you still writing, you can stop writing now. That was just a joke. The point is, they've always been the shizzle of the dizzle in the world. This country's been going on for a long time. And as I've now iterated several times in several ways, the world has always looked to China for technology, innovations, but also their products, textiles, silks, tea, uh, uh, porcelain, gunpowder. They, everybody's always, oh, what's going on there? What are they doing? Oh, what, oh, oh, what's this martial arts stuff they're doing? Oh, what's that writing style they're doing? Oh, what's that philosophy? China's got it going on. You don't think about it because they hadn't had it going on for the last couple hundred years. That is an aberration. That is the exception to the historical rule. And that's why I say I don't want to offend my Vietnamese or, or Taiwanese or Japanese or Korean friends, but China has been the source for a lot of stuff that flows out and influences heavily the cultures of all the countries and territories around it and indeed the entire world okay to a certain extent uh, and just to reinforce where china has always been where i said it's a, a longest continuous civilization it's always in that core remember back to the physical map the physical map i told you or i showed you where you had that low coastal plain area stuck right here here's Here's the uh, uh, yellow up here, is the Yangtze down here. Big agricultural belt, core belt, and that's always where it's been the center of their civilization. This is the Shang Dynasty, to, uh, roughly 15, 1600 BC. BC! Long time ago, for Jesus, all right? Uh, Han Dynasty, I already referenced, is one of the classic ages. Of, uh, of Chinese history. Han Dynasty, uh, uh, 2006 BC, it actually ran to 200 AD, about, again, about the same time as the Roman Empire for my uh, historical friends out there. Uh, the uh, Tang Dynasty, which reached uh, westward to its deepest extent at that point, that was 600 AD. And again, all these pretty pictures and pretty colors I'm showing you, look how it's always concentrated here in the East. China's always, Chinese civilization's always been concentrated in the East. They project westward, they project their power westward when they're powerful enough to do it. They might project their power northward and southward when they're powerful enough to do it. If it's under, under a very powerful, strong uh, uh, emperor, strong regimes expand. But then they collapse and go away, and maybe uh, it's a period of weakness for China, and they retract. But they always retract back to their central core, which is eastern China, not always all the western China. But I'm spending too much time just looking at dynasties. I don't expect you to know these by name. But there's the Ming Dynasty uh, about 600 years ago uh, in a period of weakness, retracted back from their western territories, centered on the eastern core. Uh, and then the Manchus, starting up in 1600, really extended to their height of their empire by about 1800 to encompass all of what's actually now Mongolia, parts of Central Asia, uh, uh, and beyond. So this is at its maximum extent, but you know this is China today. They lost some of those Russian and Mongolian and Central Asian territories, and this is what they have now, what's left. Okay, now, I've said that China was semi-isolationist, and as I've now also suggested in that last slide, 
during powerful eras, it would express itself and, and pick up more territory, progress westward and northward and uh, southward, uh, and then sometimes retract. Did China know the outside world existed? Uh, of course it did, all right? I said they were semi-isolationist, but it's more from an egotistical attitude of, we got it going on here, we don't need your shit. Uh, so traders from around the world would go down to Guangdong, and you know where that's at now, Guangzhou, all right? Hong Kong, all these areas, Shanghai, another big port city. People from around the world a thousand years ago would all come here and bring their ships and say, hey, we have some stuff that we made in our country. Can we trade it for shit that you have? Because we love all your stuff. And China would say, yeah, no, you can buy stuff. You know, bring cash. When you go to China, bring cash because we have all the good stuff. We don't need yours. And that's just economically speaking, but it really bled over into other systems as well. I, sometimes things would be adopted and adapted. Things would come to China and they would see use in some things and blend it into their society. But no one ever really came and took over China. Uh, China knew that Europe was out there. China knew uh, Africa was out there. Uh, China knew there were Mongols to the north. They're always, we're here, we're China, okay? We'll trade with you, we'll deal with you diplomatically if we have to, but that's as far as this relationship is going. We're the center of the universe, you come to us. In fact, in the Forbidden Palace, which is in Beijing, there actually is a point called, literally, the center of the universe. So again, I'm not suggesting all Chinese people are egotistical, but as a culture, China, Chinese people have always recognized that they're kind of the center of what's going on over there, and possibly the center of the world. And again, maybe they're getting that back. But even back in the day, there was lots of trade. Uh, they knew what was going on. Uh, people knew about them, they knew about people. But it wasn't like a free-flowing society where, come on in, everybody can come in and party. Sure, we'll buy your stuff. Let's have economic trade parity. We'll buy some of your stuff, you buy some of ours. Nope, don't think so. Uh, it was, we know we have the great shit you want. We got the tea you want, we got the porcelain you want, and we export hell tons of this stuff. If you're coming here to buy stuff, bring cash. You, you can't possibly have everything, anything in your country that's of value to us because we would make it ourselves already. <laughs> See how that happens? And the whole world really did want Chinese stuff. And again, isn't that still the truth today? But even back in the day, you look at uh, things like tea and rice. They used to export tons of. Uh, this, is, this map is showing you the Silk Road, the Overland Silk Road from central uh, China all the way over to Europe. Uh, the spice, China had a thriving spice trade down south. Uh, a, uh, the silk trade we've already mentioned. Uh, they, they exported so much stuff that they even made these little cups and saucers and plates out of fancy clay and they were so good at making this stuff that it was, got to be known as the best porcelain in the world and they exported so much of it, they gave it a certain name. I always forget, what's the name? What's the name of fancy dishware that you, you know, like when you go home for Thanksgiving and your mom's gonna say, hey, set the the table for Thanksgiving dinner. Let's break out the very best China. <laughs> Have you ever thought why we call that shit China? Because the Chinese made the best in the world and they exported hell tons of it. It became synonymous with the country. Well, China, what is this? I don't know. We got it from China. It's China here. China, China. We'll call it China. It's a plate's called China. Fancy cup, China. Because uh, it's from China. Sorry, I've talked about China too much, and if you were still trying to keep up by saying rich, you have now expended all of your energy for the night. Okay, so the world knew about China. China knew about the world. Uh, no doubts about that, but they always had a semi-isolationist attitude. I will tell this one quick story. I have to. Sorry, I know that I'm now three hours behind on lecture. At one point, a naval officer, an explorer from China, and this is 600 or 700 years ago, uh, said, hey, I want to be commissioned to go out and explore the world. Kind of like Columbus did. He said, hey, give me some money. I want to go check out what's going on. And the Chinese government said, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, that's fine. Here, here's some cash. And this dude, and somebody, somebody Wikipedia, uh, China's most famous naval explorer. I, I can't remember, never remember his name. I want to say Zhuge Liang, but that's not Zhuge Liang. He's a famous warrior from the Han Dynasty. Um, this guy sailed around Australia, all around Southeast Asia, all around Indonesia, uh, all uh, circumnavigated Australia, went to India, uh, went to Africa, possibly went up the western, or uh, the, uh, possibly up the western coast of Africa, 
possibly to Europe. We don't know. And he came back and, and made maps of everything and said, oh, oh, by the way, by the way, I'm back. Um, this whole big area down here called Australia, shit, man, there ain't nothing down there. A bunch of people running around in loincloths. We could totally take that. Most of the islands of Indonesia, we could totally take this. We could take this. Zhang He, I, I see it up there. Zhang He is the name of the naval explorer. Thank you for outsourcing. So Zhang He says, dude, we could totally own Australia. Uh, by the way, India is really weak right now. We could probably take over India. There are parts of Africa where there's not even any humans. We could take over these areas and make them China. And the Chinese government said, huh, OK, thanks. Uh, can you bring all of the maps and charts and everything that you produced on this voyage? Bring that in here, thanks. Put it in a pile, and we're going to catch it on fire. And they burnt all of his stuff and said, you're now retired, thanks. Good job, go live in a house in the country. Why did they do that? Because they weren't interested in the rest of the world. They were not interested in global domination. They weren't interested, why not? Because they're in China. Because China is the center of the universe. Why the hell would they go take over Australia? That is truly the kind of historical Chinese lineage. By the way, it's also rumored that Chinese explorers probably bumped into North America 100 years before Columbus too. That one's a little sketchier, but there is archaeological evidence that, uh, that may prove that eventually. So these guys knew about the world. They simply weren't interested in it. And it's a philosophical thing that I won't get into right now. It's a type, it was their type of leadership and their historical lineage, but also a kind of a Taoist principle and Confucian principle. Don't bother yourself with all that outside noise. Do what you do best. Center up. Center up, baby. Center up. This is what's going on right here. Focus on China. Rule China good. Don't go trying to take over the rest of the world. That is the way they've mostly thought. The Zheng He story really reinforces that. Uh, and I like to tell that story because there is this wild misperception, I think it's borderline psychosis by some Americans who are convinced that China's going to come take over America. If they were going to take over America, they would have done it 600 years ago before you were here, Europeans. All right, so that, that's not going to happen uh, if for nothing else because of their lineage and culture. They don't, they don't got it in them. That's not what they do, okay? So that's why I say semi-isolationist attitude almost borderline egotistical. Not that they're cutting themselves off from the world. No, 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 no. Au contraire, they made tons of money off the world. It's just they're not interested in taking over the world. And even when other entities came in and took over China, they eventually become China-fied. So if an invading army from other parts were to come in and take over, let's say the Mongols. The Mongols came into China. And why did they come into China? Because China rich. 700 years ago, China rich. So they come into China to take over the rich stuff, and do they eventually you know, then make everybody in China into Mongols? Do they impart their Mongol culture onto Chinese people? Nope. The Mongols become Chinified. That is, they turn into Chinese people. They adopt Chinese culture, and that's been the case again and again and again for a couple thousand years. China proper, all right? You're not going to mess with them. You can invade them, but eventually you'll just become us. And that's the way that it works, and it has worked that way for a long time. Now, they've always been centered on that core, as I've suggested, that eastern core, it's still the center of population, still the focus of the economy, always centered over there in the east, physically separate from the rest of the planet back in the day, that's not so much true now. And what I didn't outline during the physical part of this lecture is that if you think about China a couple thousand years ago, uh, to the north of China is uh, Siberia, nothing up there. Uh, to the west of China is big deserts and the interior basins of Central Asia, vast, dry, short grasslands, sparsely populated to this day because there's just not a lot of action there. So you have a lot of distance there too, separate, separate from the rest of the Eurasian continent. Uh, when you go down to the Indian Chinese border, you have the Himalayan system, the whole Tibetan plateau, the biggest mountain range on planet Earth still largely uh, untraversed, not a lot of trade goes across it, it's just too damn high. So separated from South Asian culture and, South, uh, and Indian in particular back in the day and still in today's world. And even when you get over to the, say, the Chinese, Thai, Burma, Vietnamese border, uh, it's the, climatically down there, tropical, tropical rainforest, it's tough terrain with jungle on top of it. Uh, so 
China has always been always been physically just just separate, different, distant from everybody else. Oh, and if you go to the east, it's the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean on the planet. So China has always had this nice little cauldron that they're distinct and separate and different from everywhere else on the planet. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why they're culturally distinct from the rest of the planet as well, including that some of that's intentional, that they say, hey, we're China, we are Chinese, uh, we play no joke, this is us, and here's what we're all about. Uh, and their culture is all actually very conservative as well. As I've suggested, they absorb ideas from the outside and make them Chinese. They absorb people from the outside and make them Chinese. They absorb philosophies and cultures from the outside and make them Chinese. Everything eventually becomes Chinese. Uh, and it's a pretty conservative culture as well. Uh, true in, back in the day, true now. In fact, a lot of people, if you ever hear the words, it's a Confucian culture or a Confucian system or Confucian ideology. Confucius was a real guy. And he was a real guy uh, who basically was a philosopher who said, hey, here's how we should run our game conservatively. Uh, we, you should respect authorities. You should respect the government. And the government has a duty to take care of you. The father, uh, the son must respect the father. And in return, the father takes care of the son. Reciprocity, baby. Conservative tradition. If all of these things are something you would think that a Republican would say in the United States, you're absolutely right. It's a very conservative tradition society. You know, respect your elders. Do good in school. Do what the government says. Don't break laws. I mean, that's conservative Confucian tradition that a lot of Republicans or conservative in the United States would say, yeah, I agree with that too. So that's the society, the basis of the society's kind of Confucian order. And that, again, plays through in government style, legal systems, and everything else. Uh, and as I've suggested also, for most of China's history, China trade is one way. You bring cash, you come here, you get stuff. You give us the money. Uh, by the way, is that, is that terribly different than today? Uh, your government in particular is always pissed off because we're like, China's manipulating their currency so that they can sell more stuff. And China's labor laws are too weak and so their labor's cheap and so they can sell cheaper goods and sell cheap stuff. And we have to buy all their stuff to stock our Walmarts, but they won't buy any of our shit. And it's like, yep, if you ever studied Chinese history, you'd realize that's how it works. <laughs> Don't get offended, U.S. Congress people. Just go study history. I know it'll be a new concept for you, studying history of the people you're trying to deal with. So um, this is always kind of the way it's been. Uh, and maybe that's the way it's always going to be. Trade one way. By the way, before I get away from the slide and get onto the history stuff, you should know that it is this precise scenario that gets the British and other Europeans all hot and bothered to the point of wanting to invade and screw with China. And that is, as the Europeans rise in power uh, and they go through their industrial phase and they're making linens and they have innovations and making guns and weapons and, and uh, bells and tacks and nail. When, they're, when they go through a manufacturing run, they take all the stuff to China and say, hey, you should buy our stuff in return for the tea that we want, because we like to sip tea with our pinky up. Uh, and we want to buy your silks and this other stuff. So you buy our stuff, and we'll buy your stuff. And China's like, <laughs> you poor fools. Yeah, you've been around doing this for, what, 100 years? We've been here for a couple thousand. Get in line. Go down to Guangzhou and get in line and bring cash. It's that actual attitude that over the course of several centuries, was draining the coffers of the British and the French and everybody else. Uh, they were basically, everybody's giving China all their money to get stuff, but China won't buy nothing back. So that was one of the reasons why the British and other European entities were like, we should, we should do something like go screw with them uh, and mess with them while they're weak so we can get our money back and have some sort of better trade balance. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk more about that as we progress to thing three. That is, China totally sucked ass from 1750 to 1950. Now, these dates are not exact, but I, what I want you to really take home from this is that it's a couple hundred years, 200 years, two centuries of total ass sucking. Uh, and it's actually referred to in Chinese history as the period of humiliation. And, and, and put it in historic perspective. Here's 
Here's the real take home I want you to get from this whole lecture. I said for about 200 years China sucked. How old is the United States? Oh yeah, it's about 200 years old. So China has been around for maybe two to three thousand years. They have ups and downs. I'm not pretending like they've always been a powerhouse, but they have been ups and they have down, crash and burn, and empires come and empires go. But they've always been a center of innovation and technology and always the center of world trade. Forever. Except the last couple hundred years when they totally suck ass and get poor and they suck. And that coincides exactly with the rise of the United States. Now the reason I'm putting this firmly in your brain, parallel these time frames up, is that, that this is the reason why maybe you, but certainly your parents, have thought, oh, China, that's a poor-ass country. And your grandparents, China, poor-ass country. And your great-great-great-grandparents, oh, China, that's a poor-ass country. And your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, China, they suck. They're a poor-ass country. The entire history of the United States, China has sucked. It's just, it's not because, it's not, we're not the reason they suck, by the way. I'm just saying, align these things. As America rose to greatness, China was stagnating and sucking and crashed. It just happens that the paths cross that way. We have only known China as a third world developing country. Now again, you guys are young enough that you're, you're hopefully already disagreeing, saying, no, I don't think that. Hell, I already know China's rich. China rich. But your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents all the way back to George Washington, that's what they thought because that was the case. All right, how did that happen? Uh, uh, by the way, this is why, I, here was the take home I wanted you to get from this. China right now says, um, we're not a rising world power, we're a returning world power. We're not new at being a world power, we're getting our position back as a world power. And again, this is something that's very hard for Americans and maybe even Europeans to put their head around because they've only ever known this is a poor place. You know, your, your, your memory is only your lifetime, which is hopefully going to be long, but it's 100 years tops. But even the society's memory of America, all of the society's memory of America for our whole history has never known China as anything but a poor country. And China's memory is much longer. <laughs> so, again, the take home is, Ah, we're not rising to world power status, we're returning to world power. We are reassuming our rightful place as a world power. We're not new at this, America, Junior, all right? Listen here, Junior, you've been around for a couple hundred years. That's a fly speck of history for, for as long as we've been around. So we've been around the block for several thousand years, you've been around for a couple hundred years. Don't be dissing us and pretending you know something we don't. Junior America. Anyway, I pushed that one angle hard enough. Let's get to this. Why did they start sucking? Okay. Well, as I uh, I've alluded to, you have this kind of lopsided situation where China is the center of everything, particularly global trade, and they're not interested in the outside world. And they could have taken over other parts of the planet. They didn't. Right? China's greatest. We already live in the greatest state. Why would we bother taking over other crappy states? But this egocentric isolationism starts to unravel. Because up to the 1700s, global interaction, all one way. I've already pointed that out. And it's no problem. Because China's also militarily pretty powerful too. And China's always, forever, as far as we know, had the largest population in history. So it's a powerful place. It's a, a defined culture and a defined government and a defined group of people. Nobody's messing with them. The Mongols tried it, and they, got, they pulled it off a little bit, but not, not, really nobody else is going to pull it off. So it's been no problem for China to play the game by the rules that it wants to play it by. In other words, the rules they write. That's been fine for most of their history, but you know that's going to become unraveled. Because as the Europeans start to rise up and have their renaissance and their agricultural revolution and an industrial revolution, and they go uh, borrow sailing technologies from uh, Islamic traders and figure out how to become masters of the sea. Then they go over to China and borrow gunpowder. And they're like, oh, cool, you guys make fireworks out of this? Cool, we're going to make weapons of mass destruction out of it. This is funner. So they put two and two together. 
firepower plus sailing technologies, and that's when the Europeans really launch out in the 1600s and 1700s to start taking over the world, and they do. Uh, this is something we'll talk about more in the European lecture, but the Europeans go out and take over, bump into the Americas, uh, and take them over and claim them, and then they take over Africa eventually, they even take over India eventually, the big country itself, they take that too, they take over Australia, so the Europeans are taking up all these places, and they eventually will get to China. Side note, jot it down, what were the Europeans doing anyway, going to America? What was Columbus trying to do? What were all the European traders like da Gama and everybody else, what were they trying to do? Were they trying to find new lands? Were they trying to bump into big areas they could take over? No, if you know your history at all, you know they were trying to get to China. There were all these traders were trying to find a way to get to India, uh, but to a greater extent, Southeast Asia and China, where all the good stuff was. Or where the spices were, and spice was like the crack of its day. Everybody wanted it. Ooh, black pepper. Ooh, I love it, black pepper. Give me some black pepper. I'll pay all I can for black pepper. Um, which reminds me of the Jim Gaffigan. This is some fresh pepper. I, I grew up on a pepper farm. This is not fresh pepper. Uh, anyway, trade was focused on India and China, and the Europeans were trying to get there. They weren't trying to find America. So all of these Europeans are out there doing this, trying, taking over the world eventually in their quest to get stuff from the Far East and actually India as well. And because China is in the Far East, so named by the Europeans because it was far from them, it took them the longest time to eventually get to China and that didn't happen until the 1800s. So as, as I have pointed out, Columbus and da Gama and that crew, they started going out and exploring in 1492 and 1498. By 1500s and 1600s, uh, the Europeans are taking over the Americas. By 1700s, they've taken over Africa. And, and, and by 18, 1700s and 1800s, they've taken over India and Australia. Actually, they got Australia back in the 1700s too. It, it's simply a geography thing. They eventually get over to the Far East because it's the furthest away from them to try to start messing with China. Uh, in Japan, one of the last places they got to. So when they finally get around to trying to break into the trade in China, it just so happens that this is a period when China was politically weak. The, the stars just aligned. Had the Europeans gotten rich and prosperous and started to take over global trade 500 years earlier, they would have met an extremely powerful Manchu dynasty who would have sent their asses packing. But it just so happens that the Manchu dynasty, as all dynasties, had grown really big, but then it got bloated and they hired a bunch of bureaucrats and increased the size of government and they just started to stagnate and they got corrupt, which happens in all governments. Everything goes in cycles. So you can get great and big, but you can only maintain it so long. And so the Manchu dynasty, the last big great dynasty of Chinese history, they just start to suck. For lack of a better word, they suck. In the past, they would have crashed and burned and somebody would have replaced them. But that was the past. Now you're looking at an era where Europeans are knocking on your door and they want in. Uh, and they're saying, hey, we want to break into your trade. And hey, we want your tea and your spices and your silks. But we want you to buy our stuff. In the past, China said, no, thank you. Your stuff sucks. Uh, but now the Europeans are more powerful. They have better weaponry, they have better ships. Because one of the things that happens in a bloated bureaucratic state that's corrupt is everything starts to stagnate. Your technology stagnates, your military technology stagnates, your transportation technology stagnates. You don't really care, we're so big and rich, who cares? Just think of a big fat dude sitting on a couch eating grapes, just getting fatter and fatter, I don't care, just, I'm already so fat and big, it doesn't matter. Well, it does when your enemies are starting to surround you, and that's exactly what happened to the Manchus. Just when they were reaching their absolute most ineffective, corrupt period is when the Europeans started showing up, knocking on the door, saying, oh, by the way, we're technologically superior to you now. we got bigger and better guns, uh, bigger and better armies, bigger and better ships, and we want to trade with you like we did 500 years ago, but you wouldn't let us. But we can change that now, and they did. And by the mid-1800s, the British... The Germans, the Dutch, 
the Dutch. The Dutch were like a powerhouse 200 years ago. Uh, even the Russians had forcibly established trading ports. They, they came in and said, um, no, we're, we're staying. We are going to trade with you. Oh, you don't like it? Here's a gun. Do you still not like it? Because we're staying. Uh, again, back in the day, Guangzhou, one of the powerhouse trading port centers down in uh, Guangdong province, there were actually places that the Europeans and other foreigners had to get in line and wait to trade. The, the Chinese controlled all aspects of trade. Down in Guangzhou, they'd say, okay, British people, here's your little town, and Dutch people, you stay over here, and Thai people, you stay over here, and Indian people, you stay over there, and you will get in line, and you will wait your proper turn, take a number, to do the official trading, all conducted and run by the Chinese government. Again, that was the standard. Uh, and now, in the 1800s, these, the tables had turned. And the British said, no, we're not waiting in line. And we're going to start pushing you people around. And we'll start shooting at you if you don't. We will get our way. And they did, because the Manchus were ineffective and weak. And all of the Europeans were in this game. Not so much other power players, because the Europeans were kind of dominating the world. And this map is just zoomed in kind of big to show you spheres of influence. And let me stress that possible exam question. None of these European powers came to take over China. They did not come to take over. What did they want to take over? They wanted to take over the trade. That's all they were interested in. They wanted the good stuff. None of these powers were thinking, oh, we should go colonize China. We should go colonize China and take it over like we did Australia or North America. Yeah, yeah, let's go do that. No, nobody was thinking that. China had like probably a half a billion people in it. And it's a 2,000 year old civilization. And nobody wanted it and it's being run badly. Nobody wanted to take it over. It's like taking over some redheaded stepchild. Everybody's like, I don't want the damn kid. I just want his lollipop, all right? Get his damn lollipop. Send him on his damn way. In fact, they all propped up this very ineffective Manchu dynasty intentionally. They're like, oh my God, no, these guys suck. This government sucks so bad. We can just push them around and make them do what we want. We can make them pass laws. We'll bribe them or pay them off, or by force, we'll make them do our bidding. And that's exactly what they did. And it was way better. The Manchus got to run the country and make way less money and catch all the blame. And the Europeans just came in and said, no, no, we're, we're just going to take the rich stuff we want. You, you do the work, Manchu dynasty. You try to hold this shit basket together, and we're going to take the stuff we want. Cool? Thanks. Ciao. We're out. That's what was going on. So this map is showing you spheres of influence. And that is the Russians were moving down from the north and starting to not take over, but control trade and control more of the area's economic power and maybe political power to a lesser extent. And you have the French who at this time had taken over and fully colonized what would be called French Indochina. They took over uh, uh, what was uh, what is now Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. That was the French down there. And so they were moving in to China from the south. The British had come in and taken over major port cities like Shanghai. And so they were moving in from the east. And even the Germans, yeah, yeah, the Germans, my German friends out there, the Germans had established kind of a beachhead in the Shandong Peninsula. And I have to point this out because I have some Chinese friends in the class, a, a wonderful young lady who's from the Shandong Peninsula, uh, which is right here, this little peninsula sticking out. And uh, Shandong Peninsula, Shandong Peninsula, I wonder what's in Shandong Peninsula that Boyer's trying to get to. It's where Sing Tao Brewery started. Huh, I wonder why that was. Feels like an exam question. Sing Tao Brewery and uh, probably many other brewery labels in China were started there because of the German influence. Germans don't go anywhere without starting a brewery and then a world war. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, but that is part of the influence of the Germans just here, but also the Brits, the French, the Russians, and the Dutch, and uh, a little bit of the Americans, although we never really took over any areas directly with influence. Is this starting to make sense? I know I'm out of time. I'm going to lecture for like another five or ten minutes. We're not going to get through this lecture. I will finish it uh, and record it for future viewing uh, while I'm gone. But let me get through this. I'll lecture for five or ten more minutes. And then we'll, I'll do a wrap, and I'll pick that up and do a second lecture. Not tonight, but some other time. A lot of people are going to have to miss it because they need to come to the movies. So kinda. It's 5 till. The, the movie's not till 9.30. Okay, um, let me get through this then so we understand what's going on here. 
this is epitomized in several historic dates that I do want you to know. I don't often have you memorize histor historical dates, but these are some good ones. These are some things that crystallize what I'm talking about. And the first one is uh, the 1842 opium wars. There actually were a couple different opium wars. They happened in different periods, but they, they are a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And that is the opium wars were fought over, let's see, what was it? Opium. Uh, opium, who's going to fight over that? Well, here's what happened. I'm glad you asked. Uh, the, the British, again, in an attempt to reverse the flow of money, because they kept showing up with stuff that China didn't want to buy, and so all of the silver and gold that they were all pirating from the New World, they pretty much were paying China to buy stuff. And so no country wants to do that. Eventually run out of money. So they were trying to get China to buy some stuff. They could never get China to buy any stuff. China said, no thanks, no like your stuff. We don't care. We make all that stuff and we make it better than you. So the British finally, finally stumbled across a commodity that they made better than the Chinese. And it was heroin. <laughs> uh, heroin, because the uh, Chinese government was a central authority, the central authority said, no, people can't smoke heroin. No, don't grow heroin. Uh, you know, drugs are bad. Uh, I, don't, I can't imagine the Chinese uh, Manchus uh, uh, 200 years ago saying this, but they were basically, drugs are bad. We don't grow heroin, and we don't want our people to smoke heroin. But the British said, oh, okay, well, that's cool for you, but we uh, grow lots of heroin. In fact, we grow it in our Indian colony and in our Burma colony. Heroin's awesome. We can grow tons of it. And look, your people love this commodity. So the British were bringing in heroin, and Chinese people were like, oh, this is great. Oh, and then they were smoking it. Everybody was getting hopped up on crack. And the Chinese government, the Manchus, were like, uh, can you stop doing that? Can you stop selling crack to our people? Thanks. And the British said, no, we have to sell crack to your people. We, it's not us. It's not us. It's God. God wants us to, and I'm only exaggerating a little, because the British came up with this awesome economic proposition at this time about free market capitalism. In fact, it was in 1776. I know you know that date for another reason, for the American Revolution. Uh, but this is when uh, the guy, Adam, oh, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, who's the guy who wrote about capitalism? Somebody crowdsource it, crowdsource it, crowdsource it. I can't think. What's the sentinel book on capitalism? Uh, you already read about it in the book. Somebody crowdsource me real quick while I take a drink of water. Do we have anybody still in here? Wealth of Nations. I just got it. I don't know if anybody got it. Wealth of Nations was written by Adam Smith. Uh, and Wealth of Nations basically was, hey, free trade is the best trade and everybody, every, uh, all countries should not limit trade and let people do whatever they want to because that's how all countries will get richer. And so the British took this to an extreme and pretty much told the Chinese, look, dude, sorry, I can't, we can't help it. Free trade. It's all about free trade. And it's our God-given right to have free trade. And so even though we're selling crack to your people, it's free trade. And we are willing to fight over free trade. And the Chinese said, uh, okay, well, if you bring more crack into our country, we're going to burn it and uh, confiscate it, uh, which happened. And then the British said, fine, we declare war. We told you free trade reigns supreme, even with crack. And so they declared war on the Chinese. They were already militarily superior. They already had better naval technology. And so they brought in the gunboats and just blew the living shit out of the Chinese uh, military at every major port that they wanted to fight at. And that was that. Again, this happened actually in a couple different periods of fighting. But it was very one-sided. And it becomes evident at that period, uh, at this point, to everybody that the Chinese are so ineffective and so weak, even militarily, that it's really uh, shooting fish in a barrel. You can do anything you want to. Even the Frenchies got involved and started taking over other port areas. The Dutch take over Macau, all right? The Dutch, do they even have an army? So that that's how you have this influence that immediately gets spread. The Opium Wars is just kind of the official launching of we're we're here and actually we're not calling shots. You will accept our crack cocaine opium, and there's nothing you can do about it because we've already now defeated you in a war. Make sense? Uh, and of course, 
this makes the central government even weaker because now all the Chinese people know that their government sucks and can't even prevent people from smoking crack in their country. And these foreign dogs and devils pretty much calling the shots off trade. Which what's important to note here is that when you control the trade, you make all the money off of trade. And so now we have a true reversal where the Chinese government is hemorrhaging money and the foreigners are making it all. Make sense? In other words, their economy starts to suck on top of their political system sucking. Uh, as a result of uh, the Opium Wars is when China has to cede Hong Kong to the British, which was, main, which was pretty much controlled by the British for, what, 140 years at that point. Uh, they also cede Macau to the Dutch, as I already said. Those are major, major, major trade centers down in Guangdong. Uh, and it's at this point that uh, fully effectively the Germans control northern China, the French control southern China, except for those major port cities that the Dutch and the uh, British control. The British also control Shanghai. So just on the coast where all the action is, China is now no longer in control of its own country or its own economy. It is starting to bottom out badly. All right. Uh, I already pointed out Hong Kong and Macau, and I'm going to end with this slide. What's going on in Japan at the same time, I wanted to reference our Japanese friends, is the same thing's happening in Japan. Uh, Europeans are starting to show up there too, saying, hey, we're going to take over the trade. And Japan, instead of fighting an opium war, fighting the uh, British or the Portuguese or whoever showed up, they decided to reinvent themselves in what we call the Meiji Restoration and make themselves like the Europeans and embrace the Europeans and embrace their culture and do what they do and embrace their technologies. We're going to talk more about that in detail when we do the Japan lecture, but I just want you to reference this. This is the point at which China really starts to fall down and become weak, and Japan starts to put itself together and rise up to become an imperial power. But that's a story for another time. So as China is collapsing, by 1895, uh, Japan actually is so powerful, they declare war on China too and defeat them. And by the way, that's when China, uh, Japan takes Taiwan and the Senkaku Islands from China in a period of extreme weakness for the Manchu dynasty in China in particular. Oh, now we're tying it into current events. Oh, I love it. I love it when a plan comes together. So 1895, they lose to, they've already lost a war to the British. They've already lost control of their economy to the Europeans. And now they've lost a war to Japan, who 30 years earlier was a group of islands that nobody cared about in China. That's how far China has fallen by the turn of the 20th century. So now Japan controls the Korean Peninsula, by the way. I'll come back to that at a later time. Taiwan, all of the islands in the East China Sea, and I've already pointed out the Europeans control uh, the coastal mainland. Uh, go here, go here, go here. I'm trying to finish this. Spheres of influence, we already talked about this. You can pause here and look at this as well. The, the last map is showing you these broad rainbow stripes of fruit flavor that, you know, like the Russians controlled everything. Not really. The, the Brits and the Russians and the French, they only controlled the, the area, the economic areas they wanted that were of the most value. So this map is actually a little bit better of showing precisely where these pockets of influence truly control the arteries of the economy. All right. Uh, and I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to uh, end with this. By 1900, and it's funny that this thing happens at an exact historic date that I do want you to know. 1900 is something called the Boxer Rebellion happens, okay? And the Boxer Rebellion was China's society bottoming out. It, it already was 100 years of decline, but now it's going to hit rock bottom. And rock bottom is the Chinese people are agitated. They're pissed off. They've been pissed off for 100 years. Uh, their government sucks. It's a period of weakness, corruption, ineffective rule. Things are coming apart at the seams. They can't control their economy. People are getting poor. People are starving to death. What the hell is going on? All these foreigners are in here controlling all this stuff. And a movement arises because the Manchus are so weak and people can't figure out, well, what the hell are we supposed to do? A movement arises called the Boxers who say, we're going to pray really hard uh, and we're going to pray so hard that we are going to be able to defeat and push out all the foreigners. Uh, and in fact, we're all going to pray so hard, and we're going to pick this day that we're going to pray so hard that bullets won't penetrate our skin. And we'll be able to go kill all the whiteys here. So let's all do this, and let's have a kill the whiteys day. It's going to be awesome. And then we have this boxer uprising. It was like basically like a cult uh, that a lot of people supported. They're like, good, anything, anything. Get these devils out of here. Uh, and so the boxer rebellion, the boxers rise up. 
They take over the diplomatic compounds in Beijing where all of these trading port cities and you know sovereign states have their diplomatic quarters. It would be the equivalent of taking over Washington, D.C. So the boxers take over the diplomatic quarters and uh, in response, instead of winning and everything's happy again and pushing out the devil dog foreigners, what happens is a great coalition of world powers that's not happened since and likely to never not happen again. And that is all of the powers I've mentioned, France, the Dutch, the Russians, even the Americans and the Japanese say, what the hell is this? Let's all work together to go beat the shit out of China. And that's exactly what they did. They said, hey, the Manchu dynasty is so weak, they can't even control this own their, uh, rebellion in their own damn country where our people are. So all of these countries worked together to send in a force of people, including the Americans, to wipe out the boxers. And it was quickly found out that even though they prayed really hard, bullets could penetrate their skin. And it was a massacre. And the boxers all got killed, and that was that. This is the end bottom line. China is now done. Everybody realizes the Manchus are an absolute puppet government. They're being controlled by foreigners. The economy sucks. Political power is not in existence. And people have lost faith in everything. It's over! And we're going to have to stop there to see how China gets back on its feet in the next edition of this lecture because the 20th century doesn't start much kinder for the Chinese folks and it's a turbulent era that leads them into revolution which leads them into communism and from there we'll get to the modern era but let's cut it for now because I know we're over time for our regular class I hope you've enjoyed this live stream experimentation and uh, I hope we can do more of it in the future uh, and maybe we'll even have some of you here in the classroom while I'm lecturing if you want uh, although I'm in a small classroom I can try to do it in another classroom too uh, only if you want to and uh, what we have going on now is uh, the Beast is going to start up at 930 over in McBride 100 and we, I will record the second part of this lecture and we'll put it online for a while I'm going to Australia and I'm going to try to live stream just like this from Australia next week, same bat time, same bat channel, and we'll lecture about Australia. It'll be fun. Uh, I think that's all I got for now though, uh, unless Katie wants to keep the, the tape running. You want to keep it running while I answer questions or you want to cut it and I can answer questions at another time? Okay, for those of you that got to go to the movie, you can bail because I'm just going to walk across the hallway to the movie. So let me try to get to some of the questions. Uh, why is Taiwan called Republic of China? Uh, it was their naming convention, and I'm going to get to that next talk, Epic Meals, that when China went into a civil war right at the era that I just finished with, they're getting ready to go into a, a, a period of utter chaos and then civil war. And when the civil war ended, one team that lost the Civil War ran away to Taiwan and said, uh, by the way, we didn't lose the Civil War and we're in charge of China and we're the Republic of China. We're just located in Taiwan. But I'll, again, that's the quick answer. I'll elaborate more detail about that next lecture. Uh, uh, C.B. George 15 says, I would consider the United States to be isolated as well. Do you think that as the Chinese economy surpasses the United States economy, Chinese culture will begin to influence the rest of the world, including the United States? Uh, I think that's already happening, uh, CBJ. Uh, do, you, do you not think that Chinese culture and Chinese economic power and Chinese influence is, affect, is affect, not affecting the United States? Uh, I will point to nothing further than the hilarious dancing Korean video that, that charted, I believe it's the first Asian song that ever make number one on the pop chart. Now that's not China, uh, but Chinese cinema is blowing up. Korean cinema is blowing up. I mean, all of these areas are starting to influence the arts and fashion. And yes, they as their societies rise up technologically, they're going to come up with innovations once again, like they used to for all of those millennia that I've now mentioned. So certainly, they're going to affect what's going on in the Western world and the entire world. The only thing I would take exception to in your statement is I would, you, when you say I would consider the United States to be isolated as well. Uh, not so much, and never really as much as China. Both countries have always suffered from what I think is a, a slight case of egotistical self-isolation. And it's, it's definitely true in the United States. We're number one, we're number one, why care about anything else? 
But economically, no, the United States has always been way more open economically. And just think about you know, the basis of the United States. It's an immigrant country. It's an immigrant country. Yeah, all the people and cultures and religions and ideas of the world have come to the United States. So, you, you, yeah, the United States has a slight egotistical self-isolation, but economically, politically, um, even socially and culturally, no, the United States is a very open place, specifically comparing it to China. Although, as you suggested, as China's influence grows, so will their technical and technology and cultural influence grow as well. Um, you said the Chinese kept on doing good but couldn't be maintained for too long. Do you think that would happen to the United States? This is from Amada. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm not in the business of predicting the downfall of the country that I live in because I love it. Uh, but I, and I don't think the United States is going to crash and burn. But all societies go through periods of birth and growth and, and, uh, and decline and death. It's, all you got to do is pick up a history book. There ain't nobody still around really from 2,000 years ago that's had you know, no changes, China included. China included. Now I've said they've been around for a long time. That's right, but they've had their ups and downs, baby. They have crashed and burned horrifically and then rebounded from it. Case in point, the period of humiliation I was just referencing. So is the United States up for a low period? Sure. Uh, everything's cyclical. Everything is cyclical. But like China, I don't think the United States is going to go anywhere for the next 5,000 years. We'll, we'll be stronger at periods and weaker at periods. Such is life. Sometimes you have great leaders uh, who are operating under really great circumstances and things go well. Sometimes you have crappy leaders and they don't do a good job and it's a depression and everything sucks. That's going to happen. That's life. Uh, let's see, what happened in Tiananmen Square again? Adam, thanks for the shout out with Adam Smith, uh, Drew Noble. I can't believe I blanked on Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which by the way was written in 17, or printed in 1776, same year as the American Revolution. Uh, and the British probably thought more highly of the Wealth of Nations release than they did the Declaration of Independence at the time. And that's probably not an exaggeration. It was a really big deal when this whole capitalist theory was put on paper and promoted. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was, uh, now that's like a mosquito bite. We'll go put down those revolutionaries right quick. <laughs> How'd that work out for you? Uh, uh, tea sipping, chip eating British. Okay, and you said what happened in Tiananmen Square again? I'll get to that uh, for the next part of our lecture as well. Opium, oh, that's just the chat room over there. Okay, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, China part two. Uh, we'll be online uh, soon, probably before the weekend, uh, and we'll also do a live stream from Australia. And please email me if you have any positive feedback, or negative feedback, by the way, uh, any feedback. I'm open for all shots <laughs> and a shot. But uh, yeah, please email me and let me know if this was good, if this was better than a Burris lecture. Uh, if you are in the class and you'd like to come to lecture live, tell me, was this better, uh, worse? Do you like, what did you like or not like about this? And for you folks who only do this online, tell me if this format, the, the camera angle and the slides, tell me if you like this better or worse than the standard uh, live stream recording we've done from Burst Auditorium. Let me know so I can tweak it and make it better for you. But for now, party on, and we'll see you at the movie or back online again. Okay. Wait for it.